Hello and welcome to episode 98 of Fergo and the Freak. I'm that bloke from Rugby League Project, Andrew Ferguson. You can find me on Twitter at AndrewRLP. Joining me once again is the glorious League Freak, who you can find on Twitter at League Freak. How you going there, mate? Pretty good. You said 98. It made me think about what were you doing in 1998? Uh, School. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd left school by 1998 and I'd had the internet for two years. So take a wild guess at what I was doing in 1998. You're batting it. Um, no. I was, I, I was I in the country. I was making websites, damn it. That's, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> batting out websites. Yeah. Um, I was in the country, so we didn't have any internet for until last week. Um, yeah. <laughs> joining us, sitting there patiently waiting for me to get to him, is none other than the legendary Greeno from the starting block. How are you going there, Thanks mate? For me. Thanks for having me, boys. Mate, absolute honour. Um Given that you're the star here and we've done all this research, um, we figured the best way to, to go here is to just to tell you to talk. <laughs> Here's the thing. You've already kind of put me off tilt because the intro I'm used to on my show goes for about nine minutes, whereas your intro only went for about 45 seconds there. So I still need another you know, seven minutes to kind of warm up into my usual uh, like pre-show state. Well, I see... I don't know that as because I, I sort of come across as the host. I I lack the entertainment charm to capture the audience for seven straight minutes. So I've got to make the intro really really snappy. <laughs> I like it. Now uh, I know Andrew this does is normally... all his best work in forty five seconds. Is what he's trying to say. <laughs> well, Steady on. I'm I'm not I'm not a bloody Iron Man. <laughs> Um, I know this is normally a, a footy podcast, um, mm. but if you may indulge, uh, do you mind if we just spend the next hour maybe talking about the environment? Yeah, that's great. I'm up for that. Yeah, yeah. Environment yeah. talk for the next hour instead of footy. You've heard? Have you heard my uh, thoughts on the environment? No. Like, uh, can you give me like a just just high points? Okay. High so, level. so basically, I want I need the environment to exist right up until the second after I die and then the entire planet can explode for all I care. I don't care about the future. I just care about leaving the biggest carbon footprint I can leave. And then when I depart, I don't care what happens. Yeah, fair point. Fair point. Yeah. Now, here's the interesting, like, so how long do you plan? Because I reckon you're kind of like mid to late 30s. Would I be correct in assuming that? Yes. Yeah. So I, I don't know, from a health standpoint, uh, are you, you're on the darts, are you a big drinker, are you in no. a fatty food? Aside I mean, from Oporto's, but... it's a lovely product, which I'm sure yeah. has no kind of health concerns whatsoever. No. Um, so you, you, you keep it pretty clean health-wise? I'm, I, I'm lucky, touch wood, in that uh, I'll, I'll probably get cancer and die within a year now. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a healthy person for the most part, so I, I don't really get hurt or really badly sick or anything like that so um so yeah my health's in like last time i went for a checkup and i was feeling a bit under the weather and i go to the doctor and i'm like oh, i'm feeling a bit tired lately and they do the blood test and everything and they're like everything's perfect and i was like really disappointed because i was <laughs> expecting them to come up with something you know it's like this uh, is the reason you're tired yeah yeah well, especially in the modern well. day especially in the modern day too you, you're actually just a nobody until you've got something wrong with you. Exactly. I need some sort of, uh, like, what, what would you call it? A syndrome. Me. Yeah, I need, to, uh, yeah, I need to be able to have something that I'm like, when people say, oh, tell us about yourself when I lead with, you know, I'm a, I'm an autistic at some level. <laughs> you need, you need some sort of, um, some medical failing. So yeah. you can use it as an excuse for why you, you know, why you failed at something, or or why you've abused someone. It just needs to, yeah, <laughs> abuse. Someone. I don't need it. I don't need an excuse for that. Um, I just need something to be as cool as like Fifty Cent's one, where he's like, "Oh yeah, I've been hit with a few shells. Now I walk with a limp." <laughs> See, right. after an illness that also fits in the cool factor as well. Yeah, like you don't want. Like, you don't want to have something where it's like, oh, yeah, I got hemorrhoids m- removed. <laughs> you know, you want it to and be And that's something... why I walk with a limp, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, like, I mean, there's, of all the reasons why you'd walk with a limp, that one's not too bad, I guess. True. I had a, there was a, I'm trying to think, I think it was an art teacher in my high school. 
and he had one leg that was shorter than the other. So one of his, his shoes, he had to have like this big clog on the bottom of his shoe. And it was really interesting to see. And, you know, no one made fun of him for it, though, which was good. We were pretty inclusive. To, to his yeah. face, I imagine. Oh, yeah, to it, yeah. yeah. Behind his I'll, back, different story. Oh, he danced upon his back. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what, you, what do you think? I was going to say, I was going to say, to the Greeno, do you have any, uh, any health concerns? I mean, other than the shared virus issue that we both seem to have as hosts. Yeah. Um, we could have a bit of a brag about that, I guess. How many times have you been sick this year, mate? Well, here's the thing. I was chatting with Damo the other day about this because I was like, irrespective of how many illnesses I may have had over the course of this calendar year, I think I've only missed two shows because of illness, and neither of those illnesses were my own. So I had I missed a, a show when my, my son decided to get conjunctivitis for – um, I think it was the course of two and a half straight months, which meant he had to be quarantined and I was the quarantine parent. So I couldn't leave the house be- until he was healthy. So I missed two shows because of that. Everything else, I might have had nine or ten different sicknesses, but I managed to get it back on track before Wednesday nights. So I think all in all, I think overall, let's call it 10, 11 total sicknesses, which I think, if I'm correct in what I've read, is well below your number of sicknesses over the course of this year. No, no, I'm, I think I've probably had 10, maybe 11. The last one I had, though, was quite lengthy. Yeah. And because I just, it was one of those ones where it was like the end of season footy trip mm. and it's like a bit of Mad Monday thrown in all at once. Let's just try and give you the the grand booba of illness. You can just have everything this week. And so I was bedridden for like two or three days and then yep. dizzy and stuff and I had everything. Don't know what it was. Um, but yeah, I've, I've pretty much covered everything. It sounds like something I had a, a couple of months back where similar thing, like I, I've, I think my body goes through phases where I don't know if I get sick per se. I think it just shuts down due to exhaustion where it's like, Hey dickhead, you haven't had more than four hours sleep for about three straight weeks. You probably need to get some rest and you're not going to do it yourself. So I'm going to force you to not physically be able to get out of bed for two days. And I had this yeah a couple of months back where um, I slept from like Sunday midday through till Monday 4 p.m. And you'd think that would be enough energy to kind of get you back on track. And I got up, I brought the bins in from out the front, and I felt like I'd just run a marathon. And I'm like, well, something's not right here. I probably need to lay down. It was another three days before I was like functionally able to move normally. And I'm like, yeah, now I'm back on track. So that's how I kind of my body works when it, when it comes to those things. It just points out going, yeah, just, just don't move for a week because you've run yourself down over the course of the last couple of months. That's a hell of a catch-up. My, my body doesn't do that. My body just says, I'm just going to make you sick, but you're still not going to get any sleep. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, see, like, the, so I've been looking into this because I've got a Fitbit about, I don't know, about three months ago now, yeah. and I was overestimating how much sleep I was getting. So I'd be like, oh, I've got about seven hours sleep, and I'd have a look on this Fitbit and say I had four and a half hours sleep. And I've found that when you get a good night's sleep, like a good seven hours, man, you're sweet the next day, and I can really feel it when I've got less than that. Oh, I, can't no doubt. The, I can't remember the last time I had seven hours of really? time with my eyes shut. Straight through <laughs> sleep. Yeah, I, usually my my typical night is 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 five hours, and that's in. It's been that way since I was a teenager. Is is that because you got kids, or is that because like? Nah, uh, it, was happy, we, it was even before we, I had kids. Yeah, I was like, can we do some background here? Because I actually don't know too much. I, like, I know the the podcast you boys do, but I, I'm intrigued. I'm like, one thing I'm going to ask both these boys is what they do outside of this show. Um, so we obviously, talk on, we talk on Skype to each other. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm thinking like. Work-wise, right, because Andrew, you obviously do the, the amazing uh, Rugby League Project website, but I assume that's kind of uh, a side project opposed to your day-to-day um, income stream. Would I be correct in assuming that? Yeah, I, I do a fair bit of uh, content writing for websites and stuff like that. Yeah, so that's your full-time job? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, nice. And, and Freaky, what do you do for a crust? I run a website and I'm a bum. <laughs> really? Yeah. So you guys literally live off the content you put out on the internet. That's amazing. It 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 just works for us, I think. I hey? yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Like we need... that, that's it's almost fun. like dream jobs, really. It's very close to it. Yeah, it's just um, throw, throwing in the podcast was a brilliant idea because 
the thing is, okay, with with what I do, okay, I usually you know do do parent stuff during the day, and yep. then once everyone goes to sleep, I get online, I do all the work I need to do, all the paid work, and then all the stuff on the website. And usually, when I get towards the end of that, Freaky will call me up, and we'll do more often than not, we'll do a podcast at about <laughs> eleven p.m. midnight, <laughs> and. I think last night was a random one where we kind of had this inkling that we might do an episode around, um, uh, what was it, a rugby league game. I think it was between Tongue, Spain, England, Spain, Spain, and, Spain and Ireland. And that was oh, Spain and about Ireland. Like, yeah, real obscure. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The game started at 2, 2 a.m. this morning, yeah. and we thought, oh, it's a bit late. We probably won't stay up for the whole game. But anyway, we, we went through and stayed up until 4 a.m. watching the whole game. Um, how long did that game actually go for? You you, you checked the time of that one for uh, It was at 100 and, 105 minutes, I believe it was all up. Yeah, it was like 47 and a half minutes for the first half and 50-something for the second half. And how much of that time was Champagne Rugby League? Oh, almost two? Two yeah, minutes, maybe right. three minutes. <laughs> it sounds about right. <laughs> It was fantastic watching though. Like, seriously, I, I could not recommend it, it more to anyone. Even if you're a casual rugby league fan, watch one of these games. Is you just see completely different styles of football. Like, even you got an NRL game. Everyone's playing the same sort of thing. But this I was game, thinking, like can... with those particular teams, there's no there's no structure, right? It's all free flowing. It's kind of like park footy more than anything else. I'd imagine. Yeah, you're kind of playing what's in front of you. But the thing yeah. is that. The Spanish players are so much more slight than the Irish ones. And so when, when the Spaniards are defending, they just swarm up and there's about eight of them come up to tackle the ball carrier. Yeah. And you think there's no chance they're going to win the game like this because all they've got to do is get an offload away and bang, tries galore. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. that game was in the balance for an hour. What was and the final then, score? Ireland ran away with it. I think they won 40 to 8 or something like that. Oh, okay. They scored nearly all the points in the last 20 minutes. Yeah, well, which was beyond what they should have been playing. <laughs> well, I say last 20 minutes. I mean, it was probably the last 45 minutes based on the way the timekeeping was going there. Yeah. The, the clock on the um, on the telecast went to 45 minutes, and then they kind of went into what we what we considered was injury time. Penalty time, yeah. Yeah. So they mu- I think they must have had a soccer referee. He didn't look like he knew he was doing too much. <laughs> <laughs> it was a bit weird. Mm-hmm. All right, so, so, so with that kind of background information about what you guys do for a crust and how your general day to day lives work, yeah. When uh, so once again, I want to do a quick. Uh, I like doing kimono pulls on my show. I want to do mm. one here. So when I was chatting with Freaky, trying to sort out a time to to do this recording, I know mm. he's like, "Oh, what time are you available?" I'm like, "Mid to late Arvo is probably ideal on a Sunday." And y- you came back to me with the time of seven p.m. and I'm like, "That normally falls into evening in my kind of like overall day to day." But now it makes sense because in your day to day, that would be kind of mid to late Arvo. Yeah, yeah, pretty so much. Like <laughs> we, like we will be. There's days where we'll be like, okay, let's uh, record a podcast at nine thirty, yeah. and there's plenty of times where we will not start recording until about eleven, really, because <laughs> we'll get on and we'll yap about rugby league, yeah. and we'll talk for a good hour or something, and then we'll go like, oh, we're doing a podcast right now, aren't we? That, yeah. That's but actually. That's right. actually our off-air catchphrase because we will say it several times before <laughs> recording anything. We're doing a podcast now. Yeah. <laughs> we did a great international one last night. It went for about two oh. and a half hours, and we didn't record any of it. And you realised you weren't recording, yeah. Yeah. It was fantastic. I mean, when we realised that we'd, we'd actually just thrown away a good podcast, you know, because it's just two people chatting off-air, there's, you know, mm. some some rather unsavoury comments get passed through. <laughs> Hang on, oh. I've listened to the podcast. There's plenty of unsavory comments that go on air. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but we go we go to a new level. Yeah, yeah. We, it's a very trusting relationship here. We know that um, <laughs> we know that we've said some things that wouldn't be accepted anywhere else. So well, we can we, we kind of protect each other when we're, when we're just having a private conversation. So so can we go back to the the origins of the Fergo and the Freak podcast? Then, like, how did this this show come about? Because uh, obviously I followed both your accounts for a number of years now. So when yeah. I saw both of you kind of joining uh, your your combined powers, mm. I'm like, wow, this is going to be sensational. So, so how did this kind of come to fruition? It's really, really – it's a very long uh, story. Andrew posted that he should do a podcast, and I direct messaged him and said, do and do a podcast. 
And he was like, yeah. And so we did a podcast. Did a podcast. <laughs> nice. <laughs> like, I think we, I, we, I said, have you got Skype? And he was like, yeah. And so we got on Skype and we talked, I think, twice on Skype. I think the first time for about an hour, the second time for half an hour before yep. we recorded the first episode. Um, and, yeah, we just went from there. Nice. And it was literally how many days before? It was probably maybe it was even a week, maybe a no, week. No, I think it was about four or five days before we recorded the first episode. Um, and we had this pretty clear cut idea, which we have completely abandoned after about a, about a few weeks. And it's going to be we're going to do episodes where we talk a bit about something's happened in history and how it ties into the game now. And you'll have a look on there. The first few episodes kind of follow that theme. And then after all, we just started doing just current news and stuff that's going on. And then we just start piss farting around. Then we just started interviewing a few people. And next thing you know, it's just this random thing that no one understands. But people are tuning in. So you go, oh, it must be working. Yeah, because a lot of the early episodes, I remember the um, that was around origin time as well when you were doing like a lot of the origin history stuff early on. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. So obviously, as a historian... I, I'm, I'm happy to put that history stuff out there, but that's also the, the the stuff that I I fret over the most. Like we had one that was out last week on the uh, 1909 season, and I I think I initially said I was going to have that ready in August. Okay, <laughs> it was a lot of yeah to do a lot of stuff for that though, and like it, it's funny because there's episodes like that where I just feel like a freeloader. Hey. And I like, I just want to start the podcast in, in some of those episodes saying, okay, this is Andrew's podcast and he's doing it and I'm just along for the ride. Bit of colour comments. Yeah. 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 Pretty and much. That's, a, that's the thing too. Like as a, you know, as a historian and a writer, when it comes to some sort of history thing like that, it's easy to write out like all your notes and stuff like that as an article. Yep. The hardest thing doing that 1909 was it's just like several different storylines many of them not actually working together. They're all just different things happening at different times. Mm. And trying to get all of that, all that chaos in an order that can be listened to, but also allowing time for chat along the way so it's not just me talking for an hour. Yeah. Um, man, that was crazy. <laughs> so it's a plan to kind of get through all the years over the course of the next couple, of, you know, on the podcast and that? Yeah, happy to happy to do whatever Freaky says. I... I, I <laughs> <laughs> I know I've never said this before, but I consider him to be the boss because he's the bloke who um, he sort of came along and gave me the the kick in the bum to start doing the whole podcast thing. I'm I'm a I'm a bit too laid back to be taking control. So he's, so he's he, got all the recording equipment as well. Oh, we've got uh, the same sort of recording stuff. Yeah, pretty oh, much. Got the same yeah. stuff. Okay, we've got a microphone fact that, and a laptop. It's more the fact yeah. that he just comes along and says, "Do you want to talk about this?" And I go, "Yeah, all right." <laughs> Yeah, there's no orders or nothing. It's it's literally like I'll be sitting there and I'll something will pop into my head and I'll be like, oh, let's talk about the Challenge Cup or something like that. And he'll be like, yeah, sounds good. How about 9.30? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing, though. We've both got a fairly similar personality. So when, the, when, the, when you get the time when you need someone to actually take the charge, we just sort of sit there going, yeah, right, whatever, and just sort of wait for the other person to do it. <laughs> Which, which yeah. puts into context the fact that with, with two people that might not want to be like uh, the the leader, if you will, to still pump mm. out a hundred podcasts in the course of six months, pretty impressive effort. Yeah, I, th- yeah. I think it's because we we genuinely like we really do talk about footy. I would say in, in a week, at least five nights a week. Where if we weren't recording podcasts, we would still be talking about footy five nights a week. Yeah, and. There's always something to talk about. And, like, Andrew's a historian, but I know uh, enough about the game's history that, like, I could, we talk about the history of the game, you know. Yeah. Um, or then, then we'll talk about what's going on right now, what we'd like to see happen. And it's it's weird because after, like, this is the 98th episode, to still have so much that we want to go on with and talk about is pretty cool. And, yeah, it's, uh, I mean... <sighs> It's kind of easy for us because, you know, we're talking about what we really enjoy doing and, and having a laugh as well while we do it. So it's it's not like work at all. It's just, you know, we, we're just pressing record on conversations, really, which is how see, we when, wanted our podcast to be. Yeah, when it starts feeling like work, that's when you, know, you kind of need to stop doing the podcast, right? Like yeah. It, it should exactly. be that way. 
Exactly. Yeah. Actually, this this all leads me to a uh, question for you, mate. Is that um, how did the starting block get started? Oh, well, here's so with the starting block. So me and, and Damo, we, we've been uh, best friends since literally six years of age. So we, we've been friends for over thirty years now, and we basically what we turn the starting block into what it is now is the conversations we were having anyway. And we're just like, oh, if we recorded this, people may find it amusing. Um, and most of the time, when, when the show first started, we are trying to do – we obviously were doing a sports show because all we were talking about at that particular time was sport. Then as we've got, grown a bit older, it was just more of a scenario of, well, we have less time to watch sports, so we've got less chance to talk about it with any kind of knowledge. Um, so now it's the bullshit you hear on our show week to week where we're just mm-hmm. filling an hour of time talking complete garbage and, and making, you know, obscure references of 1980s films, um, which is what we'd chat about if we were just hanging out, having a beer anyway. So um, that, that's pretty much how the podcast started. We yeah, uh, we applied for a few – when we left high school, um, we applied for a few di- to a few different radio stations and couldn't get a gig um, no matter what. So we're like, oh, okay, well, it's just not meant to be. And we went off and we, we started a band together instead just so we kind of could still do something. And then – when uh, when I moved to, to my current house, they're like, yeah, it's about a decade later. Um, yeah, Damo had been going around to a few different radio stations and seeing if we could get a slot anywhere. And over at uh, 2GLF, they had a slot at 6 a.m. on a Sunday morning. Oh. And they said, yeah, like, feel free. Like, you're welcome to come in and take that slot. And so he called me. He goes, dude, we've been waiting a decade. We need to take this slot. And I'm like, man, 6 a.m. on a Sunday. Get fucked, man. Like, no way I'm going to do that. <laughs> Actually, sorry. Am I allowed to swear on this podcast? Fucking yes. nice. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, just wanted to double check. I didn't want you to have to go back and edit stuff out. So I was like, no fucking way, man. There's no way I'm getting up at 6 a.m. on a Sunday. He goes, look, we've been applying for radio shows for a decade now, and this is the first chance we got. Like, once we, we establish ourselves, then we can move to different spots. And I'm like, okay, cool. Two and a half years later, we were still at Sunday 6 a.m. on 2GLF Radio with no one listening. And we are like, well, this is a bit of a chore. Um, but we were still having fun doing it. So we, we, we put up with it no matter what. And then got moved to like Thursday. We applied for Thursday nights. And we said, look, we just need to go like uh, all or nothing with our next application. Because basically with community radio, what happens is you have to apply for a certain slot. You go, I'm available these particular times. And they allocate a slot based on when you're available and when they have vacancies. So we're like, look, we can't do this 6 a.m. Sunday anymore. This is this is ridiculous. We're, we're losing our weekends. We were still in our kind of like mid-20s at that time. So we were always coming in hungover, always tired. The, the show's weren't good to begin with because we didn't know what we were doing anyway. So do that with no sleep and still probably drunk most of the time, not a good mix. So we're like, well, let's just go Thursday nights and, and say, if we're not, a, if you can't give us a Thursday night slot where we're, we're not going to do anything. So thankfully we had ended up working in our favor. So they're like, Oh yeah, we've got a Thursday night slot, like nine to 10 PM. Uh, and then we moved to, to that particular slot and did that for a, for a year or two. And then, uh, you might know the backstory of how where they, they started to charge for airtime. So normally oh, commu- yeah. community radio is, is meant to – it's a volunteer service, so you're providing yeah. free free content to the community, uh, and they're providing you free airtime. But the station said, look, the only way we can maintain this station is to start charging our volunteers for airtime. Mm-hmm. And by that point, Damo had already built a studio in his home. Um, and we were already recording the shows at his house and then emailing it in to the radio station to play at our allotted time. Mm-hmm. But the charge they were giving us was for station use. And we're like, well, we're not using the station. And the only thing we're getting is it being played on your on your station, which no one listens to anyway. So <laughs> we're like, well, we're kind of wasting our time here. And then that's how it fed into the current um, – iteration of the show where now we're just a podcast we can do and say whatever we want we don't have the restrictions we don't have to play uh radio promos and whatnot and we've got the silliness that is the the starting block there on a wednesday night and and the freedom that i mean i I remember in the early 2000s me and a few other people were playing around with doing like live streaming shows and things like that but now that the market and everything is matured and it's so much easier to to get your your podcasts out 
it really opens the door to like if you've got the equipment and when i say equipment like me and andrew literally have a i think they're 160 dollar microphones yeah and they mine's plugged into my laptop his is plugged into his uh computer and that's the only equipment we have to now be able to produce something and send it across the entire world and you can do it from your own home. I mean, it opens so many doors, and it really takes away the need to need to go to radio stations and apply for things because you can build your own show up without any help from a, a, a network at all because it's your network. Hundred percent, yeah, and and it's it's built for your particular listener base. Like, I don't know about you guys, but if we've got half a dozen people, which is probably what our regular listener numbers are, um, I feel like a superstar. I'm like, there's six people that are out there in the world that have taken the, an hour out of their week to listen to something we're putting out into the interwebs. Like, that's awesome. Like, I'm, I feel absolutely chuffed. So I don't know if you guys feel the same way when, yeah, no matter how many listeners you get, it's like I'm just putting out the content I want, and if people want to listen to it, it's a bonus, and I don't have to tailor what I'm putting out there um, in any way, shape, or form to try and appease, you know, a radio station or anything like that. I'm just going to do the show I want to do. If people listen, they listen, and it's a bonus. I'm one yeah. of those people that gets really surprised that anyone cares about anything I do. I'm not saying that in a, in a melodramatic way or being yeah. miserable. It's just, I've, I'm just one of those people that has, you know, a, a fairly low sort of ego. So when yeah. I see the, the the numbers for the episodes coming up, I'm sitting there going, wow, I can't believe this many people actually wouldn't even listen to something I have to say. And I'm, I'm the same with, with articles. When I see how many hits some of my articles get, and I go, I can't believe that many people have clicked on this. Yeah. Like, seriously, I'm, and I think it beca- it's from a, I, I come from a, such a tiny remote sort of village where you, when you think about it, you, you think in that village, you're, you're, everyone knows who you are. You feel somewhat important there. But when you think of the whole global scheme of things, you're an absolutely nobody in, in comparison. And so I think that's kind of the mentality I've got when I go everywhere else. So yeah, yeah I, I get pretty chuffed by seeing, you know, how many people listen to the episodes and stuff like that and the feedback you get online and whatnot. It's bloody unbelievable. See, I feel a bit different, eh? <laughs> in what way you're, you're you're pissed off if you don't get one million downloads or <laughs> no, one <I> million? <laughs> yeah, like yeah. If Ricky's got high million, expectations. If we <laughs> don't get a million for an episode, I say to Andrew, Andrew, you need to lift your game. Yeah, because um, it's I'm not. Doc, ever, yeah, I'm, I'm docking your pay again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I uh, no, I I guess because I've ran my website for so long, and I kind you kind of get used to the fact that, you know, people really enjoy what you're doing on some level. And um, I remember when people first started saying to me, oh, I, I like your website. Like, I remember the first uh, League, was it League Freak? No, it was the, my first NRL website I made, which was in 1990, it was the end of 1997. And I remember when that ticked over to 15,000 um, readers or 15,000 hits for the whole site. And I was like, wow, that's heaps. And like, I, I guess I always wanted to put something out there and it was more about the game in the beginning. And then as time went on, um, people wanted to hear what I had to say about different things. And it was all just writing back then. Um, and so I guess I'm a little bit more used to it. Uh, in, a, in a weird way. But you talk about 15,000 hits. Like, that's like, I always put it in the context where everyone's trying to explain to like friends and family about our show. And mm. I'm kind of like, uh, we had, I think one time we had a thousand listeners to an episode. And I'm like, yeah. I put it into the context of how many people went to my high school. And I'm yeah. like, well, it's the equivalent of there's the exact same amount of people that went to my high school that listened to this bullshit show that we just put out, um, which is like a thousand people. So do you, for you to have 15,000 hits is, is the equivalent of 15 of my high schools checking out your website. Like, I find that astounding. I think that's amazing. Well, it's, I mean, and that was in 1998. Like, I have to think back to it now. Where only and, nine people had the internet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that, like, that was before Google. I should have been yeah. making a search engine. That's um, it. <laughs> and, a, and a data, you know, a massive you're, data. You were ahead of your time company. there, Freaky. I really was. I've done yeah. so much with it. Um, <laughs> well, you, you, you live off, in, off the internet, so you, you've done something with it. I, I still uh, have yeah, to go, but... yeah, do my crust as an accountant, mate. Like uh, you, like I said, you guys are living the dream. And right now I'm talking into a furry box. Yeah. But, uh, 
the, yeah, it's it's weird. So, like, I, I guess I've been doing this for a little bit longer than Andrew because Andrew's obviously been involved with Rugby League Project um, for a number of years now. Um, but, yeah, it's cool when when people enjoy stuff. Like, I remember there was a while where I stepped back from a website and I was starting to get emails from people I didn't even know exist and they'd be like, oh, what's happened? Well, I love reading your stuff. Why aren't you writing as much anymore? And I'm hoping that, um, those people are still on board. Those people are still seeing the stuff that I'm putting out because it's really cool when you can make someone's day a little bit better because they get a laugh out of something you write or said or something. I mean, that's what it comes down to. You just want to make people happy. Yeah, for sure. Now, we've got a few questions that have come in on Twitter because I, I told people, I... I told everyone, you know, just, just a few minutes ago that you were, we were doing the podcast with you right now and I've asked for a few questions. That's good because we're going to get the show back on track because I realise we're 37 minutes in and I've turned this show into our own show where all I do is talk about your show. Well, that was, that was <laughs> the amazing become, thing. It's that, become inverted again. <laughs> we, we, we need to change this around because you, you started interviewing us. So it was almost like this is just Greeno's show. Well, I, I listened we to were your uh, guest. When, you, when you had my, my co-host on you know, a couple of months back mm. and I, I, I said to him, like, dude, you kind of just – decided to start hosting their podcast. So that was my goal, to try and meet his expectations of turning it around on you guys and, you know, hosting your own show. <laughs> well, we're completely we're completely happy with that. It's like, <laughs> we'll sit back, you can just take over. Let it's, the professionals uh, run the show. Us. I thought, yeah, I'd try and pull my weight by just, yeah, flipping the switch. Well, well uh, someone who actually, was, who you know is a fan of your show, Nadine Chilvers, has said, uh, how hard is it to keep Boogie Bumper on track? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, basically, I gave up hope on that about 30 years ago. So you, you kind of just let him go go his own course. Um, when we first started doing the show, where the, the joke was I was the straight man, and the, the his whole role in the show was to try to get me off what I was trying to talk about. Um, then uh, about four or five years into the show, the switch kind of flipped where he started, started to take it a bit more seriously. And then I was trying to ruin the point he was trying to make. And then I think we've kind of come full circle again, because I think now he just tries to throw whatever plan I have for the show off track, um, no matter where it's currently going. So short answer to the question, it's very difficult to keep him on track. As I was going so, to say, there's a similarity there between, between the starting block and us and the fact that, um, although the the similarity between yourself and mine is mostly just in viruses. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I I lack the charisma you have as a host, but I do have the same issue when it comes to your uh, co-host, who's got a lot more charisma, a lot more personality, trying to make sure you you keep him on on topic a bit. <laughs> How dare you! <laughs> so, what animals would you eat growing up? <laughs> Yeah, cat nah. eating has somehow snuck into the the podcast over over the last few months. Well, I was what you know what I watched Book of Eli yesterday. I don't know if you've seen that movie, Book of Eli. It's a good one. Nah, Does he get a cat? It starts the opening scene. Right, is that he's basically bunkered down. He's uh he's camouflaged himself, and there's a cat, and he shoots the cat with a bow and arrow, and then he eats the cat. And, of course, straight away, I'm all in. I've seen that in Book of Eli before, but I'm all in on that sort of thing. I mean, everything's just meat. So is, it, is this a cooking show or is it a movie? or what is No, it? it's a movie. It's oh, a, it's a movie. It's just a oh. cooking show. It's <laughs> a cooking show. <laughs> what sort of cooking show would they do that in? It's an obscure oh. episode of MasterChef Mystery Box I've seen. Yeah, um, that would work. Is, uh, so going back to that point, what's the, yeah. what's the most obscure animal each of you have eaten? Uh, I've had a few Australian ones like kangaroo and crocodile and stuff like that. Freaky. Yeah. I, I, it wouldn't be anything crazy. I'm trying to think. Um, well, what do you think? I'll tell you my one. I had an yeah. alpaca once. Oh, alpaca what was that? Hump. It was amazing. It actually, it was like a slow cooked lamb. Oh, um, wow. It, it just melted in my mouth. Like, it was at a five-star restaurant. So any of those obscure animals, like, I, I try and avoid depending on the restaurant I go to. But if I go to, like, a like a pretty high-end restaurant, I'm like, 
well, I trust that they're going to cook it properly and I might as well yeah. try it while I'm here. And it was a, a Chinese restaurant in Berry that had a really good reputation. It was the something duck. I can't remember the, the full name. Golden. And they had golden, maybe Peking. golden duck. It was, definitely wasn't peaking. Um, but they, they, it was like a, a nine course meal and you had to pick like obviously one dish out of the nine individual courses. And one of those happened to be alpaca. And I'm like, I'm, I'm going to double down on this. I reckon this will be okay. I'm going to try it. And worst comes to worst, I've still got eight other dishes to eat. I'll be fine. And it ended up being my favorite dish of the night. Um, but yeah, obscure animal eating, alpaca, uh, alpaca hump. Did you have to sort of go through a process in your head going, you know, before you decided to go with it, where you thought, what animal is it like? And would it taste similar to that animal? No, well, that, that's what I was, I, I blocked all that out. I just wanted to see what it was going to be like. I was just like, well, worst come to worst. Like, they wouldn't serve it if it tasted like ass. So well, I'm like, true. yeah, that was my theory anyway. So, um, yeah, I, I was pleasantly surprised that it just ended up tasting like a, it was a, a bit more uh, aromatic than a, a regular lamb. But all in all, it was, yeah, as close as I can liken it to was a, a slow cook roasted lamb. Nice. So I wonder if I've I saw a cooking show once. It might have been an Anthony Bourdain special or something, where they had yeah, some weird shit. Yeah, they went to the Middle East and they had a camel that they basically boiled, put into the ground and boiled, and uh, apparently it wasn't too bad. But you got to be careful because the hump is very fatty because that's where they store the moisture in their bodies. But uh, when that renders down, apparently through the meat, it's pretty nice. But uh, yeah, like the the weird, the only thing I've ever decided against it, and I think I've told this on the podcast, is that I went to uh, Penrith RSL Club, and they Pretty had much jelly. anything on that menu. Don't eat. <laughs> <Wow. laughs> yes, <Yeah. just> <laughs> this is going well. Good. They had jellyfish, and I I didn't even know people would eat jellyfish. So I, I didn't realize that was edible. Yeah, yeah. I picked one up, put it on my plate, took it back, and. I'm like, do I really want to be the dude that dies from anaphylactic <laughs> shock from eating jellyfish at Penrithar itself? <laughs> so I thought, I thought, nah, it's probably not the place to eat it. Like if it was in Sydney, if it, say it was at the fish markets, I'd cop yeah. that. But no, that's oh, it. Yeah, you trust that. Penrithar itself, definitely yeah. not. Um, yeah. So you're a Penrith boy for a year. I've worked that out. So uh, your choice of clubs, because so back, back in the day, uh, my go-to uh, venue of choice was obviously Panthers, yeah. because open 24 hours, no matter what day of the week it was. Yeah. Um, are you an RSL? You're a Panthers man? Do you do you venture elsewhere? Like, What's the go there? I, I, I grew up and we would always go to Panthers Legs Club, and I thought that's what a Legs Club was. Just everything was gigantic. And we used to go up to... And I don't, I'm trying to think, I think it's still a bistro area now, but it used to be like, it used to be better from my memory. Yep. And we'd go and get like roast dinners and stuff there at Panthers Legs yeah. Club. Um, I ended up going to Penrith RSL um, many years later because I basically, I lived on the same street as it. So I would walk there, um, go and get a feed. Um, there was a while where I didn't have Fox Cell at my place. So I would go walk there, get a feed, watch the footy get absolutely tanked, and then walk home. Dumble home. Um, yeah. So that was that was interesting. I always remember one of the weird stories. I, I always remember I would drive past on that on the street I used to live on, there was a brothel, right? And this it's not going where you used to think it's going. There was this in the, brothel in the back streets of Penrith. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And, but it was on the street I lived on. And there was this car that looked the exact same as my car that was always <laughs> parked out the front of the brothel. <laughs> and I always used to think, like, if anybody knows my car and knows this street I live on, they would think that I'm at the brothel all the time. Because this car was identical to my car. Uh, it was funny. So was how much did it cost you to buy that second car? Yeah. <laughs> how dare you? Was the brothel easily identifiable? Like always, like was there a red light out the front, or was um, it kind of like subtle? I think it, I think it might have been one of those ones. You know, it's how it's just like a random doorway sticking out the side of a building. Okay. Yeah. So, and uh, like I think the only reason I keyed in what it was is because when I would drive back from watching footy games and stuff late, 
um, this door would be lit up, you know, you know how they're all lit up and it'd be like 11.30 at night and this random door's lit up outside of a building. I was like, yeah, oh, that must be a brothel. Yeah, <laughs> must be. Yeah. It can't be anything else. <laughs> that or a safety injecting room. We don't know. Either way. Yeah, one of the two. They, I don't know if they had an injecting room in Penrith. I know they had one in St. Mary's. They did, the so that's where, so I, I grew up at, uh, I was a St. Clair boy. And yeah. uh, so when I'd go, because well, I work in the city, so I'd catch the train from St. Yeah. Station and have to get in pretty early sort of thing. So, you know, 5.30, 6 a.m. I'm at the train station. Mm. And they had, they used to do uh, like meth days, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And you yeah. could tell when it was meth day because yeah. you get to the station at 6 a.m. There was already a line around the door, like and literally a, around the street at St. Mary's because it was across the road from the station. And, I'm and like, it's sketchy there. It's, oh, it's very sketchy. sketchy. Yeah. yeah, but at the same time, I'm like, well, these guys, like, at least they're dedicated because yeah. the store didn't open till 8 a.m., but they wanted to be first in line for the smack. So it's yeah. like, well, we better get there at 6 because the good shit might be gone by 8. Got to get in yeah, line what, first. Well, you know what the dregs and stuff left behind that's on ah, the ground. So you got to scoop up <laughs> with a bit of dirt and stuff. <laughs> you want the good gear at the top of the pile. <laughs> 100%. You don't want the watered down methadone. You want it still in its, you know, they've just taken the seal off the top of it. Exactly, yeah, and they well, hadn't slept for three days anyway. They were already awake. We might as well wander <laughs> on down. Yeah, yeah I got my uh, I got my tattoo at a tattoo shop there. I can't remember. It wasn't Wicked Ink. It was oh, I think it was called War Paint. Maybe it was Wicked yeah, Ink. Yeah, War Paint. Yeah, because Wicked Ink's the one in Penrith. War Paint, I yeah. think, is the one in Samaria's towards oh, the back end. Um, yeah. Really, you went to Samaria's to get a tat instead of Wicked Ink? Yeah, I'm from Mount Oh, <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, I went there and, uh, yeah. I don't know if it's still there anymore. I feel like something happened to it. Yeah, I haven't been to some areas, like, since I moved out of that area probably mm. 15 years ago, I, I very sporadically go back to that particular area because there's just no need. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I, I haven't been there for a while. See, like, we... We grew up in Tregear, and so mm. if you w- wanted to go shopping, you would either go to Mount Druitt or you'd go to St. Mary's. So there'd be a lot of going to St. Mary's and going up Queen Street and all that. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I haven't been to St. Mary's for a while now. I can't remember the last time I was there, actually. Actually, I've got, yeah. I got a Mount, Mount Druitt story for you. I know we're 50 minutes in. We haven't talked about footy yet, so yeah. um, we, we probably should get to that at some point. But... Oh, no, we, we oh, briefly it. mentioned it earlier in the episode, oh, so it's all good. Yeah. Cool. Um. <laughs> Mount Druitt, so for a very short period of time, I uh, I worked at the Foot Locker at Mount Druitt. Yeah, been there. Now, and basically, so uh, I'm I'm lucky to clock in at maybe five foot four, if mm. that. Um, I'm, I'm far from a tall man. I, I probably, I'm 50 kilos ringing wet. No um, way. They, they decided to put me uh, as a 17-year-old on yeah. security. <laughs> uh, in Mount Druitt. Now, uh, for, for those listening to the podcast who don't know the demographic of, of Mount Druitt, um, there's a, a high kind of uh, what's known as FOB population, which basically means big Tongan, Samoan uh, guys. There, there wasn't anyone that walked in the store that was trying to steal some shoes that was less than 120 kegs. So my boss was like, look, here's what happens, right? If you see someone that you think looks suspicious that may have stolen something, you've got to stop them and then ask them to, like, put their hand out and you've got to kind of, like, pat them down. And I'm looking at these guys walking out, which they're obviously stealing shoes. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's not going to happen. They're either going to beat the shit out of me or they're just going to run over the top of me. Enjoy your one shoe because uh, at Foot Locker, they only put up one shoe anyway. Mm -hmm. And it's always the left shoe. So I'm like, if they want to steal one shoe, best of luck to them, because mm. <laughs> I ain't stopping shit. <laughs> so I don't know if you if you'll have the same sort of thing that I do, but I feel as though when you grow up in Mount Druitt, you have a, a little bit of a different outlook on life. So I remember I was buying a pair of Nikes, and it was the first pair of Nikes I'd brought in a number of years, and I'm in a, a shop in Canberra. And I'm sitting there and I'm chilling, you know, and I, I picked out the ones I wanted. And as I'm trying them on, I said to the dude, like, how often do you get people just putting these shoes on and then just running for the door? And he's like, oh, you know, it happens every so often. And I was, and, and 
I was genuinely interested in the topic because I'm trying on, it's only 160 buck pair of Nikes. It wasn't like the top of the line stuff. But I, I'm trying these Nikes on, and I'm like, man, you could just run if you wanted to. Um, yeah, and so I was asking him about stealing shoes in Foot Locker. <laughs> <laughs> so how many pairs did you get away with? Nah, I, I, uh, I, I, I'm not a stealer, hey. There's like, I just was curious about, like, there's weird things. I, I remember seeing somebody stealing a bike once, and I was just on the street stealing a bike, and, like, no one else fucking was paying any attention to it. I found it weird. <laughs> I was like, that fucker's stealing that bike, and no one else is realizing. No one cared. So, yeah. yeah the, other had... thing, the other thing I reckon you work out if you're from Mount Druitt is when things are, when the general... When people around you, when the atmosphere's turning south, like, and you're like, oh man, something's going on here. It's yeah, going, you know, it's going like, south. Yeah. Now, um, Richard Cranium's also put in a question. Um, he said, who was patient zero, Greeno or myself? <laughs> I reckon Andrew probably gets patient zero. Oh. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to call it a draw. It's, it's it's pretty close. We we are neck and neck, all in all. Yeah, I'm I'm happy to call the draw. Um, as much like you, you know, you got a little one that goes to kinder and stuff like that. You know, half the viruses you get are not yours. Oh no, the, yeah, I don't and, catch anything other than through my kids. They're they're a cesspool, absolute cesspool. But the worst thing too is when they come home and they're just a carrier. They don't even get sick. Like, oh, they no, come see, home I, and then I don't you have get that the mark, virus. Man. I oh. no, I always get the double down. The daily double, if you will, talking a bit of Jeopardy parlance. I get both the sick kid and a sick adult. I, I rarely get that. Usually everyone comes into this household and then I get sick and everyone else is looking at me going, what's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm the one who doesn't go outside. I'm here working all the time <laughs> and doing stuff like this. You bring all this stuff in here and I'm the one who gets sick. <laughs> It's not a fair situation. I need to get outside more often and find some viruses of my own. Bring those into the house and make everyone else sick. Ooh, dead air. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was thinking about, and and this went, uh, you know, touched on it a little bit before, Grano. Your son got conjunctivitis yep. for two months. Four times. Has- Four yeah, times in the space of two months. It was a nightmare. And had to be quarantined. So you literally, for a little bit, had a child that was like a bubble boy. Mm. Which is Not a bubble boy. We, we had a cage boy. So what we did is we had, um, obviously, you got the safety cages and stuff that yeah. you put around the house when kids are starting to crawl and whatnot. So we had a, basically a big cage that we had with a, my daughter anyway that me and my son basically lived in for the better part of two months. It's mm. um, definite cabin fever, I'll tell you that much. I can imagine, yeah. That's uh, that sounds like it sucks. <laughs> so, with the uh, the starting block, do you guys have an off season? There's no off season, and that's the beauty of no longer doing a sport program, right? Because we we found them as soon as it was post kind of like post October, sport mm. gets quiet. You've got cricket mm. to talk about, but that only filled one segment. And when you're trying to fill an hour of radio, it's uh, it made things very difficult. So. With our, our new kind of, you know, uh, reimagining of the show, now being personal journals, we, we thought, look, uh, this is going to be a, a 24-7, 365-day-a-year project that mm-hmm. never has an off-season, and we, we're going to be able to fill content no matter what. And now, so, with the, I was going to say, sorry. with the reimagining and the journal thing, is that going to change the format of the show in any way? No, the format stays the same. We just put a different label on it. Oh. I thought maybe you could have a Dear Diary section. Well, that's, that's pretty. If you listen back to the show, it pretty much the whole thing is a dear diary. Anyway, it's just random <laughs> thoughts, and you know, you know, this it's is a, what happened to, it's happened to me this week. Dear diary or like evidence. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> either way. <laughs> uh, what is there a subject that when it comes up, when you're talking about it, that it's your favourite one? Like if there's a video of something, you're like, oh yeah, this is what I'm into. Ah, uh, look, anything that's 80s, 90s movie, um, mm-hmm. pop culture type references, that's that's our wheelhouse. So anything that falls into that, we're normally happy days. Um, but yeah, aside from that, 
it's it's just what pops up really like we're just trying to waste an hour of people's time more than anything else because like you know that any time there's something political like boogie is just like oh yeah this is what i'm into well that's what we avoid so he, he already does 19 other shows where yeah. it's all political related so I, I try and avoid any political content where i can um, because otherwise it's just going to turn into his own show and I'll be sitting there silent because I have no political leanings either way, shape or form and no interest in talking about politics. So yeah. I'd rather just, yeah, just fill in the, the blanks of air with, you know, pointless drivel about, you know, Teen Wolf 2. Yeah, and for, like for those that don't know, Boogie is a big Democrat. He's a big lefty. So send him all the lefty tweets you like. He loves them. Laps it up. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now, one thing you have been working on, especially in your last episode, um, was Cameo. Cameo you... is... I, I can't believe we weren't aware of it earlier. Likewise. And I, I stumbled onto it after listening to your, your podcast two weeks ago when you mentioned it. And um, on your last episode, you are, you're asking your listeners to see if they would be able to gift you a Cameo of someone. Have you had any come in yet? None yet, none yet. Well, it doesn't help that we've only got six listeners. So, you know, our, our pool's pretty low to begin with. But look, the, the way I look at it is, yeah, we, we don't ask for, for Patreon. Um, we don't charge for our episodes. Um, we, we never really ask for donations or anything like that. We thought the, the best way, if people want to contribute towards our show, is to, to get on board by sending uh, signing us up for a cameo, getting a, a, an old-school celebrity. I think our, our two favourites at the moment are, yeah, we've got... Um, Jonathan Lipinski, we've got uh, Ingo Rademacher, and oh, who are the other ones? Oh, we had the, the Point Break uh, double down of Gary Busey and Laurie Petty. So if you want to gift us one of those cameos as a, a thank you for listening to the, the hours and hours of content we put out there, feel free. Um, uh, yeah, I think that, that'll, that'll make the show for this year if we can get at least one of those cameos gifted to us over the course of the year. Yeah, I think that would be... That'd be a good idea. Like, I think, uh, what would you want someone like, what would you want Busey to say about the show, though? Like, well, that's the thing. I, we don't want nice things said. We, yeah. we just want an honest assessment. Like, I personally, I'd like to see Gary Busey coked up off the tits, listening to an episode, mm. and then giving honest feedback as his cameo. Mm. Going, this is fucking stupid. Well, I so don't know mean, why anyone would listen to this starting block show. So, me that's and Andrew kind of were thinking of starting one ourselves, where people pay money to either hear him say something really nice about them or me say something really horrible about them. And I feel as though you'll kind of want the horrible thing. Oh, definitely. Like well, what we would your saying, price point be? Uh, well, the way, the way I looked at it was you'd, you'd pay like $2 for myself mm. and 25 grand for Freaky. And if you wanted both of us, it was going to cost you 30 grand. <laughs> <laughs> Because we wanted to make sure that we we were more expensive than the most expensive person they had on there. Who's the most expensive on there? Because I, 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 I basically uh, just went to the actors. Oh, it was... Yeah, I can't remember now. Uh, See, I, I, I thought I'm it would go be for... funny... I thought it would be funny to get, like, um, some of the random so-called influencers or influencers on uh, Instagram and get them to record ones saying... I want you to stop harassing me. Stop calling me. Stop texting me. I want nothing to do with you. And the next time you'll be hearing from my lawyer. I think that that would be funnier than have them do a nice one for you. I like it. I like it. I was actually thinking a, a, a funny version too is just have someone do, um, you, you just get someone's video that was meant for somebody else. It's got, it's got no link whatsoever to what you're doing. <laughs> so that's your cameo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just some random one for like Steve. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. Happy birthday, Steve. We go, yeah, yeah, that's our that's our cameo there. We'll just hitchhike off someone else's and don't have to pay for it. On this Instagram influencer. Or <laughs> well, you just pick someone like pick someone really random, like uh oh, I don't know. So, say I'm um, just Craig Wing, right? And you just go through all the cheap people and on, on cameo and you get them to do nice videos about Craig Wing. <laughs> <laughs> so Craig Wing's like, what the fuck is going on? Why are these people sending me random videos? Yeah, yeah. So that's like the it. thing too. When I looked at going on there and, and you know becoming as they call it talent, <laughs> that, that term is used very loosely with some of the people yeah. that are already on there. 
<laughs> very, very loosely. Um, I was thinking on that. It's, they're going to eventually get to a point where if they do say yes to me, which I highly doubt will happen, they're going to ask me what category I fit into what they've got on there. And I don't fit Definitely in any of them. So I'm going to the, influencer. Do I go with YouTuber? Because <laughs> the episodes get put up on YouTube. So I thought maybe Perfect. I could say YouTuber. We get like, you know, one or two thumbs up on every video, and most of those are just mine anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a winner to me. And then I could put in there for, I don't know, maybe, what do you, what do you reckon, five bucks? I don't, I don't want to sell myself short, but also I don't want to price myself out of the market, and I know that I'm not really in the market. That's why I was looking at a buck for a starting block cameo. Because I reckon at that point, people are like, yeah, we'll spend a buck on these randos. Yeah, I can see that. I can see. Like, I don't think you can go above five bucks. Yeah, that's max for sure. Yeah, yeah. But it'd yeah. have to be, like, for five bucks, I'd want somebody to talk about whatever I asked them to talk about for a good couple of minutes. So it wouldn't be like a 20-second grab or nothing. Well, I think that's how it works. I think it's like, yeah, 30 seconds to a minute. Oh, really? Whatever. Yeah. Oh. Um, and that they basically, they can, they can say whatever you ask them to say. Um, but once again, it's at their discretion as to, you know, they've read the script and go, yeah, I like Ian Ziering just ain't doing any material, man. Like he's, he's, he's got, you know, a, a high level of quality needed for his $10 cameo. Do you See, reckon? I would like, to, I would like to buy one where they, they pretend they're looking at a script and saying, I'm not saying that this person's a fucking, <laughs> like, I think that would be brilliant. I like it. I'd like to get one for Gilbert Gottfried where it's just full of swearing. That's pretty much Gilbert Gottfried's act, isn't it? I don't. I haven't heard him do that much swearing. Just lots of high pitched screechy noises. Oh, really? If you listen to um, Boogie's show from the other day, he was talking about the death of comedy in the the woke culture. And there's a bit at the very end. It's a, a piece uh, done by Gilbert Gottfried where he's talking about Joan Rivers' vagina for six minutes. It's actually a really funny piece of comedy. I need that to get right. into that. I've, I have I haven't watched uh, Boogie Show this week, so I'm going to have to get in there and catch up on that. Yeah, there's a really good Gilbert Godfrey uh, clip where he's on Norm Macdonald's podcast, and they're talking about Catherine Zeta Jones. And if you look, up, if you just chuck all of that into uh, YouTube, you'll find it. It's so, it's so funny. I remember the first time I saw it, I had tears in my eyes. It was hilarious. So. I suppose we've got to wrap this thing up because Greener's probably going to go off and uh, become a parent again soon. Well, the, the the house is still empty, mate, so we've still got oh, time, but we probably should talk footy sweet. at some point. I'll, I'll let you know when the, the family gets back. The yeah. the wife was nice enough to take the kids out to go get ice cream and have a ride around at the park. So uh, at the moment, we've still got an empty house, so we'll, we'll, we'll ride it out as long as we can. Nice. All right. Well, uh, your Canberra Raiders made it to the grand final this year, first time since 94 they've been there. Um, what did you think of all the drama that went on there with the trainer and the the six again thing, all sort of stuff that went on yeah. there? A lot of fans are saying it robbed them the game and all sort of thing else. Nah, it's bullshit, man. So basically, like I'm as as a fan, I'm pretty objective and I try and call it as I see it and not have you know Raiders coloured uh, glasses on with, with those particular things. The trainer being on the field, I think, definitely robbed the Raiders of a try. Um, it, like I, like I said, obviously I was at the game, so watching it live, I, I saw the ball go back, and I saw the Raiders player having the obviously stick advantage of being sprinting out of the line, and the Roosters players going in the opposite direction. So I'm like, well, we definitely would have recovered the ball and scored a try had the trainer not been there. So that definitely cost the Raiders six points there. The six again thing, ultimately they made the right call. So like, I'll, I'll take that as it is. It's kind of like no matter what. It was more a media spin. They would have been outraged no matter what happened there, right? So if they'd called six again and then the the call hadn't been overturned like it was, and then the Raiders scored off that, the controversy would have been the Raiders scored off a six again that wasn't a six again. Um, so I'm like, look, realistically, at the end, the right call was made. And at the, st- at the game, like, I didn't even realize there was controversy at all. Like, I was getting messages from people going – oh, the Raiders have been robbed here. Like, the, the rest were terrible. And I was like, oh, man, it, it seemed all fine for me at the ground. Like, we didn't know any better. And it wasn't until the next day when I was, like, checking out all the news sites and I'm like, oh, apparently there's a controversial call that I wasn't aware of at, at the ground. Um, ultimately, you, you kind of got to give credit where it's due. And the, the Roosters were the better team on the day. It, like, the six again is one thing. The trainer on the field is one thing. But the fact the Raiders didn't score a try while they, they had Kronk off the field, 
uh, is the reason they didn't win the game. The, the Roosters were just the better team, and you know we can talk about the the salary sombrero as much as we want, and whether they've got a team that you know legitimately fits the cap. But at the moment, they were the, they were the better team on the day. They've they've got the premiership, and all I can hope is uh, eventually it gets stripped off them because they they're found to be salary cap cheats, and it'll be a, a semi hollow victory there. Well, uh, my hollow victories are always good ones. Yeah. <laughs> They're still victories. Um, <laughs> what what was it like in the week leading up to the game and all that? Because, like, I, I've talked about it on the podcast before. I got my grand final in 2003. I can die happy. What's yeah. it like to see your team go through that process, all the excitement and stuff like that? I mean, did you enjoy it as a fan? I did, man. It was unbelievable. Like, I've... I've kind of uh, not so much fallen out of love with the game of footy over the last, you know, five, six years. It's more just I haven't had time to really follow it as a diehard fan. I'll mm-hmm. basically I'll, I'll follow the Raiders game, but I won't watch any other games that, that are on sort of thing. Um, so this year, we, we, the Raiders doing a bit better. It was kind of like, oh, I'll take a bit more of an interest and, and kind of see how they're going. And this grand final was obviously the most excited I've been about a, a grand final for the better part of, yeah, 20 odd years. So it was... Um, the, the lead up was amazing. Like it was the most I'd followed footy stuff, no matter what it was, whether it be, you know, radio broadcast, news broadcast, all those kind of things, just to kind of just fully in, uh, engulf myself in, in the excitement of, you know, something that hadn't, hadn't happened for 25 years. Um, the game itself, like walking into, is it ANZ? I guess it's still yeah. called now. Yeah. Um, I'd never seen a sea of green like it in my life. Like, it was something I'll remember to the day I die. Like, even though we lost that game, like, I'm so glad I went to the game and got to experience what it was like to walk into the bar at, like, 11 o'clock in the morning or whatever time the gates open. And I was like, 1 o'clock, sorry, 1 o'clock the gates open. Um, and there was no Roosters fans there. Mm-hmm. The pub was – that pub was chockers, and it was all Raiders. Like, there was just green everywhere. And I'm like, I feel like I'm home. This is unbelievable. So, um that itself was amazing, and yeah, the overall experience at the game was awesome. Um, like I said, yeah, the result obviously didn't go the way I would have liked, but yeah, it's one of those memories that, yeah, I'll, I'll never be able to forget, and uh, well, you know, dementia pending. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really glad I got to like fully immerse myself in the, the grand final thing. Like I went to the, uh, the fan fest that happened in Martin Place, and all in all, that thing was a bit of a shit show, right? Like, not much was really happening. The the grand final teams were only there for like 25 minutes over the course of the whole week. Um, mm-hmm. And even then the place was packed and the spot, I got there about an hour early. Cause I'm like, I just want to be part of it for, you know, in case they win. And it's been so long since they've been in the GF and I couldn't see anything, but at least I could say to my kids, like, Hey, I was there in case they won sort of thing. So um, yeah, with the, to answer your question, once again, a very long winded way, the, the build up was awesome and, and the atmosphere there for, for a Raiders fan was, was unbelievable. I guess, too, the main thing is that uh, even though the result didn't go your way, there was no chance that you were going to get heckled as you left the stadium because there's no Roosters fans there. Well, that's it. Like, I, um, the, the, the train line <laughs> was ridiculous, right? So, what time did game finish? It was like 9 30, 10 o'clock, maybe. Um, I looked at the line. I'm like, well, I'm not going to stand there for an hour and a half just to even get on a train. I'll go back to the bar and just drink there till the line goes down, and then I'll come back and get on a train later. And I assumed it'd be all Roosters fans celebrating in the bar. No, no, no. It was still nothing but a sea of green at 10.30 at night. Everyone kind of like, no one was really down. No one was really upset. It was just kind of like, ah, oh, you know, better luck next year, and we'll all have a beer together after the game. It's funny, I went to the uh, 2016 Grand Final with my wife. She's a Sharks fan. Yep. And um, very similar situation there as to what you're explaining there is that when we got there, it was just a sea of blue everywhere. Yep. And there was just this feeling amongst all the fans at the time when you're there that they were just happy to be there. Yeah. And the result wasn't going to be all that important. Like, they, they were probably more interested in just beating Melbourne as just as a result, not because it was the grand final, just because they hated Melbourne, they just wanted to see Melbourne lose. Um, but when they finally got the win, there was this there was this brief pause. It was like two or three seconds, and they're going, "Holy shit, we just won the grand final!" What got you following the Raiders? I mean, you grew up in Western Sydney, and all of a sudden you're a Raiders fan. What happened there? Um, I think it just comes down. So as a kid, 
uh, as like a five, six year old, my favorite player was Ricky Stewart. So at, at that point, you just kind of follow the team, whoever your favorite player is. And that's just a team I've stuck with for the rest of my life, obviously. So, you know, you don't you know, jump off the team, I guess, just because they've sucked for 20 odd years. It's just, yeah, that was the team I, I picked as a kid because my favorite player happened to play for him. Did you cop any crap from Panthers fans at school? Ah, uh, to, to be honest, there weren't many Panthers fans at school. <laughs> See, I always think that Panthers fans, they're easygoing. Like, they're not the sort of people that run around giving other people shit too much. So it's like, I mean, I had the same thing when I was at, at in school. It's like you follow whatever team you want, and it's like, oh, yeah, we hope the Panthers do well as well. Yeah. With, the, with the Panthers, I've, I've obviously got a, a big soft spot for the Panthers, more so because I've actually been to more Panthers games than I have Raiders games over the course mm-hmm. of my life. And a lot of that is my like my brother-in-law was actually a sponsor for the Panthers. So oh. he used to get tickets in the corporate corporate box and he's like oh hey i've got four tickets this week do you want to come along so i used to go to heaps of panthers games and just kind of enjoy the the game of footy without having a, a vesting interest in anything so you know always like to see that the panthers do well um obviously not not so much this year they were just absolutely terrible what's uh how many how many raiders games have you gone to in in canberra canberra and... I went to th- I went to three this year yeah um prior to that i've only been to one and what's your favourite part of Canberra? Because mine is the Hume Highway because it, it leaves. You're forgetting the porn and fireworks, Frankie. Yeah, still, you can get that in. You can get that in. <laughs> <laughs> um, to be honest, when I go to Canberra to watch watch the games, I literally drive that day and I drive back that night. So I don't oh, stay yeah. in Canberra. I, I just go, I, I do the three-hour drive down, I do the three-hour drive back. Mate, How many times do you hit you... Exeter? Yeah. <laughs> so you missed out on Questacon. I still remember that from year six uh, field trip. We're all good. I've never been to Questacon, hey? Oh, mate, you that? were missing out. That and the Telstra Tower. Yeah, you've got to go check out the Telstra Tower. Tower. Yeah, I, like, when I went there, I went there probably, I'd say, three years ago, and they must have just recarpeted it or something because it just was the most overwhelming smell of new carpet, and that's all that I got out of it. And it's like, it's. I feel like it used to be somewhere that was worth going and seeing, and now it's just a stripped-down facility that it's like no frills, and, yeah, I was very disappointed with Telstra it's, Tower. It's Canberra's centre point. Yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> as good really, as it gets. It's not really in the centre, though. Um, but the man, when I went there in primary school, they had the... Uh, went to the Australian Institute of Sport. And they had this thing where you, they had the speed gun in the cricket net. So you could go in there and you could throw the ball up the end of the net and see how fast you could throw it. The problem with it was it maxed out at 99 Ks per hour. So everyone's wow. sort of running in as, as kids thinking that they're um, thinking they're bowling really fast because they're getting 99 Ks per hour. But we didn't actually know if we're bowling faster than that or not. And then when you, you see the speed gun at test matches a few years later and Shane Warne's bowling at 90 Ks now, you're going, <laughs> yeah, we weren't really that <laughs> Maybe we were bowling a, a bit quicker. As a ten year old though, that's that's pretty good pace. It wasn't too bad. Mind you, the pitch was a bit shorter too. <laughs> There's a thing you can do as well, we they had this screen set up next to I think it was a ten meter racing track and you could run along next to I god, I think it might have been Darren Clark on the wall or someone like that and see how fast you were against him over ten meters. And the the screen lit up next to you as you ran past him and everyone always lost because that was yeah, you can't have Darren Clark losing. Ah, uh, definitely not. Yeah, that shit was rigged. Yeah, it was. Didn't they okay. call him like the fastest white man in the world at some point? Yes, it did back then. Yeah, he, he yeah. was right up there when it came to like world champs. Just didn't do anything at Olympics. And then yeah. Alan Jones signed in to play on the wing for Balmain, and then That's he sat right. in his seventh grade, and just got crunched, and then retired. <laughs> that was during the era where, yeah, just random footy teams were signing either NFL players who they thought were fast and just chucking them on the wing. Who was the um the Newcastle player they signed? Greg, Greg Smith. That's the one. He was an NFL player? He was – I think he played in a oh, – you know, the preseason practice squads and games and yeah. stuff like that. And he was in train on squads there. But I don't know if he actually played an NFL game. There, there was – yeah. Um, yeah, I remember, and he was just terrible. He, he played, he played like two games for Newcastle off the top of one, my head. One. Oh, one, was it? And yeah. I think he dropped like three bombs and made four yeah. or five defensive errors. And even as like, I think I was probably maybe 10 or 11 at that time. I'm like, yeah, this kid's not going to make it. 
Yeah, it was a very it's, short, well, it's the fun. most memorable one game career ever. Yeah, all well, the fact, yeah, we're 25 years later and I can still remember that guy. Not his name, but I remember how bad he was. He was like the poor carriage of the regular season. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it as being two games as well for some reason. Hey, I, like if somebody had said, tell me about him, I'd have said, you know, in his first game, he didn't do anything wrong, but the second game he got found out bad. But it was just the one game. I don't know where that comes from, where in my head it's two games as well. Well, I just checked this website called RugbyLeagueProject.org, and uh, right. it was just one game. Round three saying, against Canterbury. You stole my joke, man. I was like, oh, maybe we should check out Rugby League Project to find that. <laughs> well, I, I, thought, I thought Freaky was lining me up for that one, so I thought I better start <laughs> getting looking into it. He played outside Owen Craigie. That sounds about right. And he was yeah, scored by I, Gavin Lester. Wow. Who did Gavin Lester play for? Bulldogs. Bulldogs. Okay. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have guessed that. There you go. Ricky yeah, Stewart he... played in that game too. Oh, that was during the, the Forgotten Era where, yeah, Stewart and Clyde played for the Dogs for what? One or two years? It was two years. Uh, it was two years. Then Ricky Stewart went to Bulldogs. Was it just after he had uh, was it encephalitis or something like that? And he had to go to hospital, almost died. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Bradley Clyde, he played for the Bulldogs. And then, like, it was clear his career was over. And then he went over and played in Leeds. <laughs> <laughs> and dominated, right? Oh, uh, they well, they were like, "What the hell happened to Bradley Clyde? <laughs> who um, who won the Man of Steel this year? Did uh, Blake Austin win that? Uh, I thought uh, was it him or Jackson Hastings? Jackson Hastings won it, did he? Yeah, I was intrigued because it's always just some like average Aussie Aussie player who goes over there because their career is done and they can't cut it at like NRL level. And they go over there and just absolutely dominate. And I, I picked Blake Austin to win it this year, just on the fact that he's got talent, he just can't defend. But that's not going to matter in England, right? Yeah, well, like, the thing is, I mean, some of their fucking players that have won this award, that, like, this year it was Hastings, last year it was Ben Barber. Well, if you had have gone back when Ben Barber won that award and said, hey, Ben, you know, you're not going to play rugby league again. It was be, be weird. Uh, Luke Gale, who are some of the other... Rangy Pat, Pat, won it. Pat, Pat Richards, Richards won it. Won it. Yeah. That was when I knew that reward was a farce, when you've got a winger <laughs> winning the best player in the entire league. I'm like, yeah, yeah it doesn't say much for the, the English Super League. No, nah, although when you see the English wingers, you can understand how even a slightly half-decent winger like Pat Richards would look like a god because they're so bloody terrible, the English wingers. <laughs> it's pretty fun. Uh, Paul Wellens won it in 2006. Yeah, see, and that was, I mean, Paul Wellens, as I've said to you, Andrew, my favourite joke was to put up a, a still image of Paul Wellens and say that's him, that's a video of him running, because he yeah. would run so slow. What what, what, is he, what position do you play? Full back for the, okay. uh, for the uh, Palms. St. Helens. Yeah. So he... dodges. <laughs> is uh James is it James Tompkins? Is he still going around? Sam Tompkins. Uh, Sam Tompkins, yeah. Sam Tompkins, that's the one, yeah. yeah. He played uh playing. in the nines. He played in the world nines, uh, and was probably England's best player with weirdly enough, James Graham. Um <laughs> the rest of them were garbage, but those two were pretty good. And what did, what did you guys of, make of the nines? I loved it. I went both days. Yeah. Um I really enjoyed it. I thought it was great. It was a pretty good atmosphere. They need to promote it better it needed a bigger crowd than it got but and the other thing they need to do is with the final they don't need to have the final at 9 p.m they need to condense the finals of it but uh yeah for that over the the club nines or uh, what do you think is the better of the two 100 percent better than the club nines yeah i prefer the i prefer the uh the world nines i think the club nines is just dull Okay, so I, I used to like the, the Club Nines, just a simple fact, like me and my mates made a weekend of it, so mm-hmm. we'd all get together on the Saturday, like, you know, I think first match was like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and yeah, that's when the drinking started, and then you just drink over the course of the whole weekend, you just sit there, watch footy for for a whole weekend at some random pubs. Um, yeah, look, for make, me, make, it's, make... I was going to say, for me, it's, it's I like the fact that you can watch some players you, you don't get to see often or at all. And that's what I liked about the the World Nines, whereas the NRL Nines, you're just seeing plays you're going to be spending the whole year watching. Yeah, alcohol inf- Well. <laughs> it's funny, because when I was at the World Nines this year, 
I was like, if the next time they have it, if they have it in Australia, I want to get tanked. I want to get like absolutely brutally tanked at the game. And it's then we'll record difficult. a podcast live. <laughs> yeah, I know. I It's very difficult with the watered down beer that they've got. Though. It's like ridiculous how watered down the beer is. And it was like some Han shit. It was like, you know, that Han, Met, already Han Metro beer? beer? Yeah. Yeah. It's ridiculous. That was one of my gripes with the grand final, right? So yeah. the, the bar beforehand, so the bar before you go into the stadium, was yeah. charging like eleven dollars a schooner for mid strength beer. Um so I had two there and I'm already twenty two in the hole, but then I bought rounds for like my dad and my brother in law who came to the game with me. So mm. there I'm already yeah, sixty six down before I've walked into the stadium. But then mm. so I was surprised because inside the stadium the beers, albeit still mid strength, were eight bucks. So I'm like, well, what's the three dollar markup on the exact same beer outside or inside the stadium? That's ridiculous. Yeah, insane. I think you've got to go if you want to get drunk at the footy, I think you've got to, just before you get there, just hammer spirits. So that <laughs> by, the, by the time you get to the mid-strength watered-down beer, you don't even care. <laughs> like, it's just basically water. So, yeah, that's, that I think the, that, that's... It was a high-wire act I was treading for the grand final because I wanted to drink and I wanted to be, like, pretty hammered by the end of the night, but I also <laughs> wanted to be sober enough to enjoy the game. Yeah. It was a very tight balance act, that one. Yeah, see, I've had that problems with – because a number of years I used to do big reviews of State of Origin games yep. um, after the game. But then it got to years where I was getting absolutely tanked during State of Origin games. <laughs> and I'd, the next day I'd sit down and be like, right, what happened? And I couldn't remember anything. No uh, idea, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there were – like there was – there was even a grand final, and I can't remember what grand final was because I was tanked. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And, like, people going on about the halftime entertainment and stuff, and I couldn't remember any of it. And there was, like, one where I couldn't remember the second half whatsoever. Yeah. CTE? Possibly, yeah. I'll put it down to CTE rather than being completely annihilated. Could have been trying to sit down on one of those weird seats with the flippy up thing and forgot Mm. to do the flippy down thing. Then you just fell down and banged your head on the back of the seat. Straight up the point. I almost yeah. lost my mobile phone doing that at Parramatta Stadium um, during the nines. I'd put my phone down between my legs because, as you do, you know, I'm hoping I'm getting texts all day. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. but the, the, I got up to let someone go past, and the seat flips back, and it slips my mobile phone onto the thing behind me. So I thought I'd lost my phone. And luckily, I found it. What's a um, uh, question for you boys? What, what's your preferred yeah. method of watching the footy? I'm going to give you four options, right? Um, what? Naked, <laughs> naked, cock in hand, um, yeah. at home, fully clothed, watching <laughs> with a couple of beers, at the game solo, at the game with mates, or at the game with your significant others? Mm. I, oh, it depends. It's different for different sorts of footy. So I like watching the grand finals and state of origins at home with beer. Okay. Uh, I enjoy watching games at the new Parramatta Stadium because I think the the view you get from there is better than you get on TV, quite honestly. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm keen to get out there next year. I've I've just been waiting. The the Raiders played the Eels this year in a para home game that happened to be at fucking Darwin. So I'm like, well, I guess I'm not going to Bank West. Yeah. It's it's so worth like I the view is so good at Parramatta Stadium, I would consider getting eel season tickets just to wow, go and okay. see good footy that that nice. close up, yeah. Um but then you know, I watch so many games uh at home. Like I'm I'm the sort of person that doesn't attend to well, normally doesn't attend too many games. There's been to a lot this year. But yeah, so for the most part I, I like watching with a a beer at home, I guess. Yeah, I'm a uh, at at home yeah, you're not a... watch watching type thing because let's be honest, I I live in Melbourne. I I don't want to go and sit with Melbourne Storm fans and watch a game of football with them. Fair point. <laughs> what? Do you... Okay. <laughs> hey, we've got the appearance for your daughter, man. I was waiting for it. Yeah, it's there. She's just telling me that some TV shows on. I like nice. it. They've still yeah. got TV. I like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What what do you prefer, Greeno? Like how do you like your footy? 
Um, I'm 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 a stay at home kind of dude. So yeah, I, I prefer just watching it on the TV, ha- having a beer. Um, with the exception of those those big games. So mm. like like I said, grand final. If any, if my team or like my dad's team or my brother-in-law's team is in it, we always go just because we want to be there to experience the day. Um, because it's it's an event opposed to just a game. Um, but if if I just want to sit down and watch a game of footy, I prefer yeah just to watch it on TV. Because despite the fact that their yeah, commentary aside, the the product <laughs> they put on television is is better for for the most part than, than trying to follow the game um, as a, as a live event. I think. Who's who's your favourite colour commentator? Colour commentator. Yeah. Um, Apart from me. Main, main, <laughs> main game but, callers are, are pretty much set in stone. You know, most people. Go, probably, you know, Vo- Vossi's the best caller out there. I agree. Colour commentators. I, I there's there's actually oh uh, Billy Slater is my answer. Yes. Um, I, nice. I hate to say it because as a player, fuck, I hated him, and I'm like really channel and I saw the evolution of Billy Slater where he tried to get his profile changed a year before his retirement, where he started doing a lot more kind of like footy show appearances and going on those particular shows. And I'm like, he's just working his way into the media here, but he's one of the few color commentators that actually provides insight into the game, um, which is what I want from a commentator. Like I don't need. Yeah, exactly. I don't want whinging. I I said to my wife on um, Friday night, I flicked on the test match and I like, I, after the, the grand final loss, like my, I was trying to avoid all footy in, in any way, shape, or form while I was dealing with the depression that came out at the end of the game. And I was like, oh, I'll, I'll flick on the footy because there's nothing else on a Friday night. And I was watching the game, and I said to my wife about 25 minutes in, I said, look, I, I haven't missed this. And she's like, what, the game? I'm like, no, no, this commentary. I'm like, I'd rather just watch this game on mute because I forget what it was. I think, yeah, Joey and Gus were crapping on about something that had nothing to do with providing any insight into the game. It it just annoyed me. And I'm like, yeah, I'm almost tempted to flick off solely for the commentary. And by that point, the game was already out of reach, I think, for for the Kiwis. So it didn't matter. But yeah, the, the commentary leaves a lot to be desired, not just in the footy realm, like the, the cricket realm is the exact same. Like, since the the old school days of say your, your Richie Benos, your Tony Greggs, and Bill Lorries, and I know I guess they they kind of immortalised because of you know Twelfth Man and all those kind of things. What they did best is they provided silence where where areas of silence was needed, and you could just appreciate what was on the screen. Um, exactly. You don't get that with footy, which is a, a bit of a pain. Um, and plus, with the rugby league media the way it is, they the there's a compulsion to want to whinge more than just praise the game or talk something good and i think the thing that frustrates me most about phil gould and andrew johns especially with their commentary is if you took the whinging away from it they have two possibly the greatest minds that have been involved in the game over the last 40 years yeah definitely and yet they fritter it all away and throw it away so they can sit there and just bitch and moan and whinge about the game instead I want to know, kind of like, I want to know strategy. Like, I want to know what's going through a player's mind during that set of six. I want to know, yeah, like game plan, like what what they're looking at in the line. I don't want to know them. I don't want to hear about them complaining about, you know, oh, the referee did this or, you know, just all that frivolous bullshit that they keep on complaining about, about, oh, too many penalties, too many penalties. Well, there's too many penalties because they're adhering to the rules. Like, it's as simple as that. Like, yeah, I I don't want to, I don't know, maybe. Uh, once again, maybe it's just because I had like rose covered colored glasses on as a kid. Like I can't remember commentary being like this as a kid. No, it never um, was. I remember listening to it and learning about the game and understanding the game. And that's what made me a fan of the game because I got to understand the, the strategy behind it and whatnot. And, like the day before the GF, I know I tweeted it out. I don't know if you guys saw it. I, I went back and I watched the replay of the ninety, uh, the eighty nine, the ninety, and the ninety four grand final. And one of the biggest takeaways I got from from watching those replays was the difference in three. And yeah. the, the play by play was the exact same, which is fine. Um, but the the color commentary was all about strategy. It was all about game plan. They were talking about you know how Ricky Stewart puts it into a certain quadrant for a certain reason, and you know the the line that Bradley Clyde runs, or or what it means, or like the the power that Steve Roach kind of you know bent the line back, things like that. I'm like, wow, this is what I remember commentary being like as a kid. And it helped me like learn and appreciate the game a bit more. Now it's different. Like if I'm a kid growing up learning the game, it's like, well, the refs are fucked, right? That's pretty much it. 
Exactly, yeah. And it's. I think it started going downhill when the commentators start started to try and put their personality into it and it turned out they didn't have a personality and like they'd start <laughs> to talk about the block and dumb shit like that that no one cares about. The other thing I've noticed with the commentators, right, and, and this is no, like I, I'm going to use Jonathan Thurston as an example. It seems like the rule is we're going to sign up who are the great players, but not understanding that just because you're a great player doesn't mean you're a good commentator. Um mm. Jonathan Thurston probably is one of the worst color commentators I've ever seen in my life. And he's only one year in, he might grow into the role, but I'm sure there's a lot more articulate uh, players out there that might not have had as successful a career as JT, but would be much better suited for this particular role. I, I don't know what the hiring process for all these roles is. Like, Corey Parker's terrible. JT's terrible. Um <laughs> I can prove Steve Roach. How did he get a job on Fox again? Like, well, he knows, it's, it's, he, knows he knows writing slang, and that, that's important. Yeah, just, he, he caters to the people his age in that in that group. Gets them back in when he says writing <laughs> boulders and Vera Lynn's. <laughs> you need to get those in there. That's the language they understand. Rhyming yeah. slang from England. Like, I, I just want someone who understands the game and can, and can provide a bit of insight. Not yeah. I don't care if they were, they were a star before. I'd rather listen to someone who actually knows what they're talking about. Yeah, you know, one Colin com- commentator who I think is who is uh, I, I initially thought he was just absolutely hopeless. The more I think about it, the more I realise I think he's there for comedy value, and that's Braith and Asta. See, I I remember listening to Braith and Asta when he first, he was still playing with the Roosters at the time, and he he was a, a colour commentator of a, an under twenties match on Foxtel that I was listening to. I think the Raiders were playing in the game. And he was he was really good. He was actually really insightful. And then I think he went back, obviously went back to playing and, and, and didn't hear from him for a little while. So now I see all these kind of like bashings of Braith and Astor in the com box. And I'm like, wow, I remember listening to him maybe eight, nine years ago and he was really good. Like, has he changed his mentality? Does he just give wow. no insight whatsoever? I think he got a bit cranky one day when he was at West Tigers and he found out that he had to buy his own power raid. <laughs> <laughs> And I think it made him a bit sour and a bit cranky because yeah. he he spent about one or two years after he retired being sort of Corey Parker in the commentary box where he just whinged about everything. Yeah. And then for the last 18 months, he sort of lightened up a bit and he sort of, you see him smile and laugh occasionally and trying to make a bit of a joke. But it's, the thing is, he often gets his words muddled up. Usually, if he has to say more than eight words in a row, he's, he's you know there's a car crash coming at the end of it. And I think that's, that's a general a... rule for for footy commentators, though. Like, pretty, yeah, keep it much. to like two syllables and you know nine word sentences. We should be sweet. Exactly. You know so what I think... I think it is. You know what I think it is because like I've been doing the color commentary for uh, Swa Sports, and it is something you've got to learn how to do. But I think that there's a danger you can get into where. As you're learning when to speak and and how to get your economy of words down and and things like that, you can start to sound like everyone else. And the problem is if you're surrounded by a bunch of morons and you start sounding like everyone else, you just sound like one of the morons. Is that an insight to your fellow commentators on Swa Sports there, Fricky? No, it's it's more about what what you see on Channel 9 and stuff like that, where... You know, because, like, I I guess the thing I always want to do is, you know, keep being me rather than just sounding like the, you know, plug in and play talking head that some of them turn into. But then you also get the ones that just, they say ridiculous, stupid shit. And you're like, why are they talking about this during a football match? So you get to a point where you've got Andrew John saying, Oh, if you rugby leagues played at this speed, not that speed, and then slow that down, and I don't. Or you get fucking uh, Peter Sterling talking about scenarios in a game that don't exist. <laughs> like he starts arguing about stuff that didn't happen. It's like fucking shut up and call what you see. That's it. Just yeah, keep your mouth shut, right? Uh, yeah. So that's what I think it is, and and I I like Braith and Asta because I think it's all satire. I think he knows what he's doing. I think so too. I actually, I'm a like I didn't like Braith as a, a player, but I, I grew to like him like outside of the field. I think he's I think he's actually really really talented. Like obviously he's got the golf skill in the background, Long John Braithy as we used to refer to him on our show. Um, <laughs> it, yeah, he, he's he's actually got some skill when it comes to the off field stuff. But 
Um, yeah, seems to cop a pretty bad rap when it comes to his commentary. So, who's your favourite player? Current? Yeah. Ah, uh, good question. Time. All time. So, all time, it's got to, it's got to be Sticky. Yeah. Um, Sticky was yeah, the guy that made me a fan of footy as a, as a four or five-year-old. So, um, mm-hmm. he's my all-time favourite player. Um, followed very closely by Sean Fensom at number two. Oh, wow. I just like the way the guy plays, man. Like, you, you want to see a player that plays with heart. Um, when he came through, because he, he was under 20s, yeah, under 20s captain when the Raiders won the, the under 20s cup in, I forget what year it was. Um, and yeah, he was, he was kind of the player. I just, yeah, I like the way he played current players. That's a good question. I probably don't have a, a favorite current player. Um, just trying to think I'm going through, through the Raiders squad. I like what Shans did this year, but I wouldn't say he's my favorite player. Oh, Jordan Rapana. If I'm going to go a guy on, on the Raiders, I just, there's, there's a guy, that's a guy who just doesn't give anything other than a hundred percent. Um, and came back from a fractured skull. Like you, you're yeah. talking about someone who's got some character and like some, some like will to want to play footy. Like he fractured his skull. He's like, yeah, I'll be back in six. Yeah, <laughs> it's impressive. When, when, when you're playing footy, and they say to replace the divot, and it's in your head. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> 100%. So, yeah, probably Jordan Rapan is my, my current favorite player um, on the Raiders squad. As an overall enjoyment factor of players I enjoy, it's it's hard to get past the beach sprinter, is it? He's a... Uh, I don't know. No beach sprinters in rugby league. Who's, who's yeah, the beach, beach sprinter? Yeah. <laughs> You telling me there's a beach sprinter in rugby league? I, I thought you. I thought you guys on Friday night because literally as soon as Damian Cook made that break, they yeah. Rabs mentioned that there was a beach. He used to be a former beach sprinter. I'm like, I have to tell the boys about that on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> there's some weird things. There's some players that they have things that just are always attached to them. I always the thing with uh. Carl Webb, oh, golden gloves, golden gloves, yeah, Carl Webb, golden gloves. And then he gets into a boxing ring when his career's finished and just cannot fight at all. <laughs> Speaking of yeah. boxing, uh, is it just me or are you guys also hoping that Gal gets his ass kicked by Barry Hall? No, you know no. what? The, the, no. The AFL no. media have been going absolutely nuts over Barry Hall and how he's going to okay. own Paul Gallen. Yep. And living down in her, here in Melbourne... It's all Barry Hall. So I oh, see. I haven't heard any of that. I've just seen random clips of Barry Hall oh, training. Yeah, and I, I just reckon Gal's a bit too smug for my own liking. So, well, the thing is, Hall's talking up a big game. He, he said he's going to knock out Gallon. I haven't heard Gallon say anything like that. He's he's Gallon smug. I agree with you on that one, but he's not out there trying to predict what he's going to do to his opponent. He's yeah, just being enough. smug. <laughs> and yeah. Um, I, I always like it when these AFL types, they're like, oh, we've got hard men in our game. And like, remember when uh, Mark Guy beat the ever-loving shit out of the guy that was in the Ever Ready commercials? Jacko Jackson. Oh, Jacko yeah. Jackson. And they were like, oh, and he just, Mark Guy, it was like, it was like, stop him. He's killing him. It was terrible. <laughs> and I just would like Gallon to beat the fuck out of this guy. And then uh, move on to whatever next celebrity they decide to wheel out for them. You got to remember least... that uh, Barry Hall has a bit of form. If you go back to as a Brent Staker, the West Coast Eagles player that he knocked out and got suspended for twelve weeks for. Yeah, he yeah, can but throw I mean, a punch. But but, yeah, but it's an AFL player. Yeah, he's an <laughs> AFL player. What did you uh, What do you think of uh, Nelson uh, Sofa Solomon's uh, thing over there in Bali? Well, don't fucking start fights with somebody that's six foot five and one hundred twenty five <laughs> kilos. That was the first thing that went through my head. Fuck me, can that like, guy throw a punch? Eh, like that wasn't haymakers. He knows how to throw. Yeah, also, I think that's even if he, he even if he threw a out. haymaker, the arc he's got on that thing, it'd be like if you had one of those uh, whippersnippers to do the edging with. <laughs> <laughs> it covers such a large circumference. He'd wipe out seven people in one swing. Yeah. But there is, I feel like. Have you ever seen NBA fights? Like, they can't fight at all. And they they do the same thing. They whip their punches from, like, you know, the next suburb over. And they're not good at fighting. But, you know, there was some some, uh, boxing promoter that said he wanted to get him into the ring to fight someone. And it's like, really? Based on that video, the thing I would have is just, have him doing celebrity boxing there in Bali. That would be great. 
just have him fight. I want to see him fight the guy that <laughs> drop kicked the other dude off the scooter. Remember a couple of months ago, there was an Australian guy over in Bali. And he I remember that, yeah. A, yeah, drop kicked a guy for a scooter and then got hit by a car and walked it off. I want to yep. see that fight. Yeah, that guy's <laughs> tough. He ain't staying down for the 10 count. Yeah, that was like the. It was like a reverse. Remember in Street Fighter where there was a bonus round where Ken or Ra- Ryu would bloody bash up the car? It was like the opposite of that where the vehicles were bashing him up and he just keeps on getting up. Yeah, should they, have, off. should they have this bout on the back of moving vehicles? Now we're yeah. talking. I like it. Yeah. Beating and the fuck yeah, out so of each other on a tuk like tuk. Box, a box <laughs> tour. Tuk tuk. Now we're talking even better. Yeah. Tuk tuk touring Bali. A live event. They just go around or someone gets unconscious and they replace the opponent at the next round. Yeah. Took took MMA. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Mixed martial took tooks. Yeah. MMTT. That, Have you guys uh, touched on the Brent uh, Brett Finch thing over the last couple of days? No. It's... No, we haven't mentioned it, have we? It's um. What do you make of the the media coverage of it? Like, I guess the the whole kind of media identity aspect of it is one thing. Like, is it reportable? I think the fact that the Fox Sports didn't touch on it, or it was really just kind of swept under the rug after the podcast thing uh, mm-hmm. about a month back, mm-hmm. um, makes it reportable. If you know, know what I mean. It's an interesting, yeah. complex situation for Fox Sports here because on one hand, they were happy to run stories about Sam Burgess and his wife and that AVO thing. Which... Well, the thing today where he's got some bikini chick on his shoulders. Yeah. He's but... a single man now. Like, who cares? Why is this news? Exactly. But they were happy to run that and justifying that that is news. But all the drama around Brett Finch and the, the appearance on the podcast and how he was on the plane, um, in my opinion – just like the Sam Burgess stuff, neither of that is news that we need to know about. It's not news. It's just prying into someone's private life. I don't give a toss about that. So, but because it happened to one of their own, uh, oh, we can't, we can't do this. He needs a bit of, we need to look after him. But Sam Burgess, yeah. he's different. We can go after him. That's fine. But we've got to look after Finchie because, you know, he's not playing anymore and he's been struggling a bit. You know, how can you be sensitive on one hand and completely uh, just ignore all of that on the other at the same time? Yeah, well, I guess the same kind of point goes to, like, I've I followed the coverage. Well, like I said, I refuse to click on a lot of these articles because I don't want to get involved in clickbait. But I, oh. I've found I've taken an interest over the last, like, six weeks on the way the media is covering the situation about the Tigers, obviously your team there, Andrew. Yeah. Um there's just no positive stories that seems to ever come out of Tiger Central, right? And that can't be just coincidence. Like, there's obviously a, some weird media vendetta or kind of like maybe they don't leak stories to certain um, reporters. So they're like, well, if you're not going to leak stories, I'm just going to do these hack pieces on Ryan Pat- Madison's going here or, you know, this player wants to leave because they're unhappy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's interesting. Like, I think there's a few a few factors involved. And one is, um, this is my opinion, um, a lot of the management of the West Tigers is woeful. Okay. And so a lot of the time stories get out when they shouldn't done. I mean, classic example, you look at Justin Potato and his drama with Robbie Farrow's contract last year, and we're going to make yep. him an ambassador and just tell everyone about it. And all of yep. a sudden the Tigers, are get, you know, that's salary cap fraud. You can't do that. Here's a penalty. And like, oh, but we, we were trying to be honest. You know, no, you're being stupid. Yeah. That's a classic example. And then the Tigers, to to what they did to learn from that was to give him his job back. Yeah. I, um, I also think you get a scenario where, and it, it was shown up with Darius Boyd, when Darius Boyd wouldn't talk to the media, and I wrote an article about it saying he's well within his rights because, yeah. you know, it's not hurting. He's paid to play football, and any extra income he would earn from sponsors, they're not going to go to him if he doesn't talk to the media, and that's on him, and he was happy with that. When he wasn't talking to the media, they would hammer him, and they called him all sorts of stuff. Um, And then he started to talk to the media, and it changed, funnily enough, when he started giving them content. And I always say this about when you see – um, news articles, and they'll say like, "Oh, this celebrity's been a recluse for a couple of years." It's like, what does that mean? Like they they were living in a mansion, living a wonderful life, but just not talking to the media. That's not a recluse, you know. Um, 
you, you've got to be careful with the way the media frame stuff because they are very vindictive if you won't give them content. And we see it time and time again in rugby league. And it's it's really, really gross. I think it kind of po- – like, it's interesting. It poisons the game a, a little bit. And people talk about, oh, you know, because of these particular stories, like, oh, it's going to – like the NRL needs to do something. And I'm like, well, the NRL is not in control of what the Daily Telegraph writes. Like – yeah. As, as much as, you know, people think it's all one big machine, but, like, ultimately, the yeah, the, the, the 100 right there for you here, like, if you're not feeding the media content, they're just going to write what they write about, say, the Bulldogs or the, what they write about the Tigers. Like, exactly. I haven't seen any positive pieces about the Bulldogs in you know, how many years now. Um, it's all that, hack pieces. Like, yeah. it's insane. And the thing is, too, that these clubs don't need to rely on these media companies to get their, their information out anymore, like their game day stuff. And they, they've got more followers on Facebook and Twitter and yeah. all this. And it is only a certain section of the the community that you get through social media, but it is still a fair whack of the community. So they don't have to rely on these media companies so they can give them less. But then, as we see with the media companies, they just – you know, they'll make shit up if they have to. They'll create yeah. stories. I mean, how many stories have we seen that are just created out of thin air um, or innuendo or guess guesswork and things like that? I mean, Sam Burgess is, Sam Burgess is living the dream and they're trying to turn that into a negative. It's like, yeah. no, he's doing, I'll swap places with Sam Burgess right now for, in a <laughs> sec. You know, I, I'm, I'll, with honestly, the bikini model on his shoulders, uh, put yeah, him on freaky I'll, shoulders now. I will ditch you too. She can be on my <laughs> shoulders and I'll be in fucking Mexico or wherever he is. And I'll wear the leopard skin bloody fucking pants he's wearing or whatever. You've seen it? Be. Yeah, there you go. He's in the Fred Flintstone gear. Yep. Yeah. And let me yeah, tell you. When, when, you when you said, Freaky, that, um, you know, the clubs have got more Twitter followers and stuff like that. Yeah. Were you taking into account the burner accounts as well of these journos? I wasn't taking into account the burner ah, accounts. See, you've you've <laughs> got to remember the, the burners. burners. Hello, hey, Fran, Fran, if you're listening. Fran, the one. ML12445. <laughs> yeah, M- ML was a good one. The ML was thing... the best one because ML had a burner account for his burner account. He's yeah, an absolute yeah. genius. He's like, yeah. I'm going to go next level. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support my own burner account. And that's the thing. The burners were actually were not supporting... Him, they were supporting the other burners that were supporting. Hundred percent, yeah. It was, it was like next level shit. It was Matrix style, man. Yeah. What is that it, movie it, where? And I forget the name of the movie where they go dream within a dream within a Inception? dream. Yeah, Inception. Inception. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It was bloody Twitter Inception with these <laughs> idiots. And <laughs> the like burner like, within a burner within a burner. <laughs> and you need a bloody te- you need a fucking telephone number to set up a new account, which means that these dickheads were using multiple telephone numbers to set up burner accounts for themselves like i remember people used to say to me oh you set up other accounts and stuff it's like i'm too fucking lazy you know if i want to upset people what am i doing any different to what i do now i didn't need a burner account but these journos apparently do and the funny thing is it's just to praise themselves yeah Yeah. can you can you imagine setting up an account to praise yourself (laughs) it's the main thing about it (laughs) the main thing about it is the fact that um, they they have they do this thing where they they put themselves in this echo chamber because if anyone disagrees with them, doesn't matter how politely they do it, block. Yeah, and so the only people that are left talking to them are people who have the same opinion as them, and then they find that that's boring, so they go yeah. and write an opinion piece where they try and get drum up some some different uh, opinions, and then they remember, oh, that's right, we don't like it when someone has a go at us, so block, block, yeah, block. block. Yeah. <laughs> So if you if you lack the spine to accept criticism, don't be an opinion writer. I, I don't I don't get how you how you can try and be both. You can't. You just can't. You can't. It's like and the the stuff that you get sometimes it can be nasty, but you know you got you just get rid of those people. It's the ones when you get constructive criticism, read it because you might be wrong. What's it? Yeah, if it's an article that's written that has facts in it. I'm more than happy to to read it, whether it's something I agree with or not. It's yeah, yeah it's that innuendo, it's the gossip. Like it, it's like high school when it comes to, to footy media, which exactly. is really kind of poisoning the the fan base unintentionally and through no fault of the NRL. It's just yeah, what the media is putting out there. 
Yeah, I always say to people, just don't read the newspapers and don't take in any of the shows that are on TV, and you'll enjoy rugby said, league way more. I haven't, um, I, I haven't read, a, a, I haven't clicked on a Daily Telegraph article in about four and a half years, and I'm a happier man for it. Because yeah. I just, I find myself getting angry, and I'm like, hang on, dickhead, like, you're in charge of what you click on. Like, if these yeah. articles are making you angry, just stop reading them. Like, because you yeah. know they're bullshit. You know this, it's all just made up stuff. And that's why I really loved, um, uh, is it Ben Wallace on Twitter, who did the, the rumor manga tracker earlier this year, mm-hmm. and was showing the, the accuracy of articles compared to what the actual outcomes were in certain rumors. And some people were like 30% accuracy, but they're considered as journalists, and they just astounded me. The good thing about the, the having the podcast, I must say, is that I started going and viewing Daily Telegraph website again because it, it gave me the opportunity to provide content for this show where we can sit there and um, mock the media for everything they had got wrong or every opinion they had that was stupid. That's what we used to do on a Sunday morning. We used to just buy the Telegraph and just read through buzzers like Sunday column and pick out all the stupid bullshit. And we got about 25 minutes out of our hour, out of that one article. <laughs> it was that easy. His, his spotted columns are fantastic there because it's just like spotted. What was the one the other week? Josh Dugan took his dog to the vet. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's what journalism. Was the, um, what was the, the rumor about Dugan this week? Uh, it was some oh, nightclub incident. I refuse to click on any of the shit. So yeah, I, I, yeah, I've I not read into it. it. He, he apparently had some sort of scuffle or something at a nightclub somewhere. Is this just a way that the uh, Sharks are trying to get him off contract? Possibly. I dare say the Tigers will pick him up. Yeah, he'll, be in the, he'll be in the back line with, just, with uh, Matt Moylan and what are the, whoever uh, else. What are the, for, uh, for Freaky, what about the rumours that Matty, Matty Moylan back to Penrith? They, they can't be uh, that stupid, can they? Hopefully not. Because I remember that, that, that fucking finals game where he's out there mass- chucking the ball around with the ball boys. He's completely fit, and we're about fit to play as, the yep. game. It's like, go fuck yourself, Matt Moylan. That was my exact thing. He was captain that year. I, and whenever yeah. I talk about Matt Moylan, that's the game I point to. Because he mm-hmm. was injured for the first final, but he was fit for the, I think it was it was the one before the prelim. And he was fit, and he, he chose not to play. I'm like, your fucking captain chose not to play a, a qualifying final? Like, get rid of him. Like, I don't want him anywhere near any club. Like, that's terrible. Yeah, no, Pen- and look, Pen- if Pen- I was a Pen- Pen- Sorry. I was going to say, Penrith Pen- chatting with him now. Oh, it's, yeah. it's one of the rumors that, yeah, Sharks want to offload him, obviously, because he's played three games in two years, and they're paying him 800 Um, And Penrith was one of the rumored spots. That's yeah. madness. Very, but, it made me angry. And, like, I remember that game so clearly because I was furious. And I was thinking, like, why don't one of these Panthers players go up to him and ask what he's doing there on the field because yeah. they're rugby league players and he's not playing rugby league. Oh, so angry. He's the fucking captain. Like, that was yeah. the worst part. If he was, like, a fringe player who was like, oh, I don't think I can I – can, I'm not quite up to scratch this week, you know, maybe a slightly different story. I'd still be angry as a fan. But when your club captain chooses to not play a finals game, like, that's just unheard of. Sackable. Yeah. Oh, but we were sackable. They shipped him off to the Sharks the next year. <laughs> What do, you, what do you think uh, of next year, Freaky, for the, the Panthers? What are they going to do harvest-wise for, to replace Maloney? Are they going to bring in Luai or that, that kid that played the one game and had a man-of-the-match performance mid-year? Or well, Moylan. Like, <laughs> or Moylan. <laughs> now, look, they've got three youngsters that they can choose from. It's a, a bit of an embarrassment of riches. So I'm not too worried about the 5'8 position. I'm more worried about their forwards because okay. their forwards are so goddamn soft. Um, and, it, like... It doesn't matter what the rest of the team does. Like they've got some really good backs. They're always going to chew out backs from their their uh, junior base because they've got so many juniors to choose from. But the forward pack is what really worries me. Um, and unless that that improves, they're just going to have another season like this year. Fisher Harris, I thought was a big standout this year. He was probably one of your best. Um, yeah. He Isaiah was. Yo is a guy that plays with all heart all the time when, if he can stay on the field. I think so he, did, he, did he retire? Is he retired now, Yo? No, I thought he was still playing. I th- like, yeah, he's still playing, but I, because he got, had a couple of, like, he was getting head knocks and just beaten down, you know? It's at some point a player, 
it's almost as though their body just gives in to the punishment. And I thought maybe he'd retired, but I, I could be wrong on that. Um, wrong. that I, I can't believe I'm wrong on something. Hey, this is <laughs> this, the day. It's the first day. Um, that, look, they got rid of, uh, what's his name? Campbell Gillard. Campbell He's Gillard, I think. Para. It wasn't the same because it was, it was a head fracture, jaw fracture, something like cheekbone. Yeah. He had one of those like head trauma type injuries where he just didn't come back. Yeah, as a front rower, you've got to be an absolute animal. And I think the fear of the, that injury, just he just wasn't right once he came back. Yeah, it was weird. And uh, like <sighs> Fisher Harris, he was one of the better ones. Tamo is like a fringe first grader now. He's on big money. Yeah. Um, you know, kick out is fantastic, but I worry that too they much reliance, me. man. Yeah, too much reliance. It was all and, just give the ball to kick out and hope for the best. And he's playing so wide out in the field. It's like I think he needs to move in field a bit more, especially with the size of him. Like if all he did was hit ups, he'd be a really good forward. He yeah. has all of that extra skill and stuff like that. But I think that they've pigeonholed him a little bit too much. I'd like to see him move in field a little bit more. Um, they need some more. They, like, there's talk that they'll get uh, Warrior Hargraves from the Roosters. You can't pay that. He's, what, 31 already? Like, Yeah. And, that, and he's, they're going to be paying overs for him at that age too? Yeah, and with his judiciary record, I mean, how he many plays games? nine games a year. Out of him? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of hoping that there's some forwards in the lower grades that they're going to bring into first grade because we really need, we need a new forward pack. That's what it comes down. They're lacking down. a bit of mongrel, aren't they? Like it's, yeah. it's that, that front rower who has that kind of clemmer aggressiveness. Like they were wrong. I think uh, JWH should be a good addition if he was maybe four years younger yeah. and on about 300 K less. Cause it's exactly. exactly what that pack needs. Like to I thought he actually had a pretty good year this year, but um, at the same time, for the money he's on, he didn't produce what you want, and he's a bit of one of those soft front rowers where he gets his meters, but at the same time, like he doesn't really bend the defensive line back. Um, yeah, well, like no one's worrying about playing the Panthers pack. No one's staying up at night. It's like playing against a bunch of bloody Aaron Woodses. Mm. You know, you you go to bed and you have a good night's sleep. That's who Tamal reminded me of this year. Yeah. James Woods, who will rack up, you know, 180 metres, but you're like, oh, I didn't realise he got 180 metres. Yeah, exactly. But there were 180 metres, which were all just kick returns, so the first 30 metres of each run yeah. was just gift metres. 100%. Yeah. And with kick out, he reminded me very much of uh, Tedesco with the Tigers. It was, yeah, we don't <laughs> – he's our best player. Just give him the ball and hope something happens. Yeah, yeah, and that's what worries me. And, like, you could see some of the – he, he was starting to get some bad habits and you could see some of them bad habits coming out in the nines. And I know nines is very different and they're trying to do some things, but like this to dude that is absolutely massive. He moves very well. And if he just stayed in the middle third of the field, he would be fantastic. Yeah. And it, you know, they they really need to get him. I think in that middle third of the field and those offloads that he's normally doing to centers if he was doing them to the fullback, and the problem is the Panthers don't have a really good attack and fullback, but to, if they were doing, if he was doing that to dummy halves, his halves pairing, and the fullback, they would be really, really dangerous because you make a break up the middle of the field, you're through. Yep. Um, but they're not doing that, and I don't know why. Yeah, a couple of positions for mine. I want to see Penrith get a solid number nine. Um, who's the guy who played nine for the second half of the year? He looked okay. Um, Egan's gone. It wasn't oh, yeah, him. Yeah, he's gone. Um, Leo Curran, wasn't it? No, no, that, he was the back row. Uh, Katoa was yeah. terrible. He sucked. Um, <laughs> I forget the guy's name. He, he started at number nine for the better part of the second half of the year when they started to turn their season around a little bit. But anyway, like the thing I've looked at with the Panthers is, yeah, you're right. Like for, for the most part, their pack's been okay. They've always had the, the backs, but the, the last time they were competitive is when they had a really good nine with like Luke Prittis. And I think yeah. that's always what's lacked for Penrith over the last five, six years is just not having that really solid number nine that even if he plays 60 minutes, but if they can, you know, get some uh, some early ball out to the backs and, and quick, good service, they'd be a much more uh, potent team because they've got all this youth out there on, on the edges that, that they can quicker get the ball to them, the more potent they're going to be, right? Yeah, and they got the, the dude from Manly. What's his name? Coruscant. 
Corusau, that's it. So he'll be a good addition. And he's he really is the sort of hooker that they needed to get someone that can, you know, make some meters out of dummy half. Be, and the Panthers for a very long time, and you're right, it's since Luke Brutus has been gone. We really oh, they got him had, back. Yeah, they got Cor- Corusau back, yeah. So, it, like, they really have struggled. I mean, I remember through the Matthew Elliott years, we got <laughs> nothing out of hooker. Oh, like, I, I love your Matthew Elliott takes, by the way. Fuck. <laughs> Fuck, man. I've been, uh, you forget I've been following your Twitter account for a decade now. Like, I, I yeah. love your Matthew Elliott takes. And he, <laughs> he's an expert commentator on fucking the ABC radio. It's like, expert, what's he saying? Yeah. Talking about <laughs> fucking wind chimes and shit. <laughs> fucking. Don't start me. <laughs> but All you yeah. got to do is, is mention that name. And everything in, in Friggy's head just stops the current conversation. He just starts having conniptions. It's- it's like a, a hypnotist when they say, you know, when I say the word chicken, you're <laughs> going to yeah. say Matthew Elliott and just yeah, freaky it's just, game. It's the stuffing oh. of the fingers. He starts, yeah. he starts twitching and he starts <laughs> clenching his fists and he's supposed to start punching holes in walls. Yeah. <laughs> it's taken fucking Canberra like 20 years to get over the Matthew Elliott era. <laughs> like he, It's like the relief was getting Neil Henry in there yeah. as the fucking coach. That's a good Jesus story. Christ. <laughs> Well, I, I think with um, with Penrith being reported to be chasing Matt Moylan, what are the chances, given that I saw one report saying they had a bit of a war chest to work with? I love the fact that war chest exists war in rugby chest. league today. Yeah. Um, if you're doing a war chest, you'd probably go Pappenhausen, wouldn't you? I know they're, they're saying that he's going to sign with the Storm until 2020. But it's, but... but it's Ivan Cleary. He likes paying big money to second-tier sort of players. I mean, look look what he's got sitting in reserve grade at the West Tigers. Yeah. <laughs> Russell Packer. Uh, now, Packer wasn't his signing, was he? Yeah. Oh, he was. I thought Packer ben, was there the year before. No, nah, Ben Madalino. Yeah. Um, See, I thought all those things, uh, Reynolds. Um, Chris yeah, McQueen. I thought all those signings were before Ivan came into the club. Uh, and then... Ivan brought him over. Paid oh, him big we, money. We, we just got this, after the, the Jason Taylor period, the, mm. the club's salary cap was a mess when Jason Taylor was there. Yep. So when they then had to get rid of him... They at, at the time, by the time they got rid of him, they'd also just started to fix up the salary cap. Yep. So they thought, right, Ivan, you've got a ton of money. Go get what you need and make us a make us a good size squad and make us successful. Get us in the finals. And halfway through the next season, after making all those signs, he goes, oh, "Fuck is I'm going to Penrith." <laughs> <laughs> See, the problem it's, uh... is it's not a war chest. Like they've got their terms mixed up. A war chest is what you have and you keep it for when you're going to go to war. What we do is pay tribute to other clubs because we fucking sign a player for five years and then we tell them six months into that contract, oh, we're going to move you on now. And then we pay another club fucking 80% of their salary. So the war chest isn't a war chest. We're actually paying other clubs to have our fucking players. Well, it is. It is. It's, it's, a, on, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a Penrith war chest that they're gifting to the other 15 clubs. But the oh. other 15 clubs are in a lottery. They don't know which one of them is going to get the war chest. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think they're actually still paying for a bit of Moylan's contract anyway, so you might as well bring him back. Probably, eh? <laughs> it's fucking those Phil Gould contracts. They were brilliant. I, it, I would like to see us... Just clear the decks and just go to go to Ponga and say, listen, you can play alongside Cleary. You'll be at a club that's always producing juniors. Just come on. Come on board. We want you. We need you. And that's that's my dream. But it's I not just how much you're going to pay. If I was a Penrith fan, that's the last player I'd want. Talent-wise, definitely. But if, if you look at how much effort he put into the last six games this year, I'd be massively concerned to ever bring that guy into my club. Yeah, but you've got to remember, he's playing in Newcastle. <laughs> you know? I mean, Newcastle, first of all, there's nothing wrong with Newcastle. Newcastle's a fine place. I wouldn't want to live there. And then he's playing outside of fucking Pierce, who just goes missing. Like, any time the game's close, he goes completely missing. And then he's got fucking Brown as his coach, who's like, yeah, just stick with the plan, stick with the plan. Oh, sorry, boys, I'm out. And so, if I'm Ponga, I'm looking to leave. Yeah, I can't see him lasting after this year. Like, I don't care. Is it O'Brien that's taken over as coach? Like, yeah. Uh, like, I, I don't care how much of a super coach they're re- reporting he is. Like, if if they don't get things back on track, I can't see Ponga sticking around for another year. 
No. There was, a, there was another rumour about another young player which came out today, and that is Parramatta might be looking to put in a 10-year, $11 million bid for Latrell Mitchell. No, that's that's fucking so made up. It's not funny, right? Like, there's no be. way that's legit. It's got to be. It's got to be. That's his manager just going, what figures can I make up? Because then yeah, if yeah. I get him, you know, four-year, four million, I look like a genius. <laughs> The other Good. thing is, like, I mean, how old is he? He's 24? No, I think he's younger than nah, that. Latrell's younger than that. He's only like 21, isn't he? 21, 22? Something like that. But that, like, that still takes him through to being, like, in his early 30s. That's it's just... like, you don't, you don't spend that money on a player that, I like, I like the, I was talking about it last night with someone, or yesterday, the, um, the Wayne Bennett philosophy of, like, mm. I only spend that much money on halves and fullbacks. Yeah. Like, remember when he, he shipped Petro off? He, he told um, is Andrew G. Yeah, Andrew G. Nah, man, like, I ain't paying you more than 400 You're a front rower. Like, spend your money on halves and, and fullbacks and nines. Everyone else, no more than five 600 That's the That's rule. true. But the thing is, like, did you ever read Wayne Bennett's book? No, nah, because I, I didn't trust that Wayne wrote it, because it would have been absolute drivel if he did. Let me tell you, I read, I read it, and I got about three quarters of the way through. And yep. when he started talking about, and this is in the nineties, this is before Super League, and he's like, "Oh yeah, we needed some, some depth in the forwards, and we're, you know, we knew that, and we, so we got Glenn Lazarus, and it's like you're not, you're not a super coach. Fuck off, Wayne. You're not a yep. super coach. You just put fucking Glenn Lazarus into <laughs> Broncos team. Fuck can, it. can I, can I make the same comment about Trent Robinson? Now, this, this dickhead, the attitude he had after that grand final win, when Jonathan yeah. Thurston did ask him about, you know, the six again, blah, 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 yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Like, the, the, the attitude and the smug way he responded to that, and even in the week afterwards, yeah. um, I'm like, dickhead, have a look at the team you've got. Like, you could literally put a, a bag of sawdust as the coach of that team, mm-hmm. and they'd probably make the top eight. Um, yeah. They don't need a coach. Like, you, you're talking about a team that has what? Eight uh, state of origin players, and overall maybe I think it's like thirteen uh, rep players overall. Um, there's only literally there's only like four players in that team that either haven't played internationally or for state of origin. Off yeah. the top of my head, that's and, it's, because they're just they're just kids. Yeah, exactly. It's just insane. Um, like that team is so stacked. It's it's the Ricky Stewart coaching mentality of like O2 roosters where it's like, look, anyone could take that team to a grand final. You're not a super coach. Calm down. I love the way that he handled the question too. Like they're all joking around and stuff. And then Thurston brings it up and it's like, all of a sudden Trent Robinson can't speak English. He's yeah. like, Oh, what? Huh, what? Huh, You're talking what? about the whole game. I mean, yeah. we're talking about this one specific thing. Oh, but what do you mean? Like, there's refereeing, refereeing problems throughout the whole game. No, just fucking answer the question, dickhead. Yeah. Like, you just won, won the grand final. Just go, yeah, you know, things. Like, I can give you the answer. It's not that hard. It's go, yeah. you know, things, yeah, it was a tough break, and but that's what the ref called, and we can't do anything about it. They get all you snarky. Just, just own it. Just yeah. be like, listen, if they had had six more tackles in the whole contest, do you reckon they would have beaten us? That's it. We defended it with 12 men or just go, well, ultimately they made the right call. So, you know, it was unlucky, but at the same time, they, they've got the right decision. Like, yeah. Anyway. Let's go back to the Tigers, man. Oh, I'm intrigued as to what the plans are for next year, considering half your caps plan reserve grade. Um, I don't even know if the Tigers know what they're doing anymore. <laughs> but they had this thing, okay, a couple, of, a couple of years ago. They had this recruitment guy. And he basically bought, you know, he, he made so many bad decisions that um, he, he, the club just said, you know, what, we, we, we're just going to try something different for a while. We're not going to say we, we're cutting ties. We're just going to try something different for a while. So, Reynolds has probably got to be one of the worst signings for the, in club's history, right? Oh, no, Adam I Blair. Don't know. It might not be in the top 20, and we've gone Ooh, reckon, well, Adam Blair at least played first grade, whereas yeah, Reynolds has played but, maybe, what, half a dozen first grade games in two years? Adam Blair was just turning up and just and just checking his card. Mm. He wasn't doing much. Um, nah, fair point. But, so they got rid of this recruitment guy. He went to, I can't remember the order of it, I think he went to Manly, and we know what happened to their, their um, recruitment there and their salary cap. They end up getting yeah. a fine for their, their cap being an absolute mess. Um, so after that, he then went to the Bulldogs. And we know what happened with their salary, the cap there, and what happened with their roster. Um, and so after that, the Tigers decided to bring him back. 
you know, history of success, obviously. That, I don't know why they the, did it. Now they're talking to Matt Moylan. <laughs> they really, they really look like they're going to struggle to maintain their ninth place. They, yeah, I don't think they're going to get ninth again. No, no, it, it feels like they're going to fall off a bit. The streak of nine is just—it's an impressive uh, footy record, really. Is nine? Is nine? Uh, I know eight is uh, auspicious to the Chinese. I think seven is as well. Is seven nine anything? Is, yeah. Nine, yeah. Um, it's a lucky number out Campbelltown way. Yeah, that's true. Got to get that nine. But then um, again, luck in Campbelltown. Like you're in Campbelltown. Well, I do feel I do feel obliged to ask Freaky. Yeah. If you had to pick one place to live, and yeah. the, your, your only options are Campbelltown or Tamworth. Oh, Campbelltown is like Bondi to Tamworth. <laughs> Tamworth, if you had, to, if you gave me the two choices, and you were like, you, you, I'd just be like Campbelltown every day of the week. Campbelltown has an Porto. Campbelltown is <laughs> in a civilized city. Campbelltown is near; it's close enough to the fucking coast. You can go to the coast. And Tamworth's. <laughs> not the place that I. We, we, we could just move on at that point. Yeah. Please move on. <laughs> so Matthew Elliott. Fuck off. <laughs> Fuck off. All right, gents. I've just realised we've just hit over the two-hour mark. We have. Yep. I was just looking at the clock, and I was thinking at some point Greedo is going to have to go and do something, otherwise he will have burnt up all of his brownie points. Oh, the brand points are fine. It's just my bladder is so full that I'm like, uh, it'd be uh, an awkward moment if I piss myself on the podcast. So I'm going to uh, bid you guys adieu at this particular point. And uh, no. thanks, Heath, for having me on, man. I really appreciate it. Thank that you is the best. On. That is the best way to say goodbye on a podcast episode too, by the way. Well, they only take, go take a piss. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Boys, have a good 100th episode. How, what, two episodes away? So that'll be, yeah. yep. you know, uh, what are we now? Sunday. So, Tuesday. 100, it'll be Tuesday, yep. Yeah, yeah. we've got big plans. Awesome. Let's um, let's get together again. Let's do yeah. uh, the, the complete uh, amalgamation of both the Block and the Fergo and Freak podcast. Yeah. Uh, we'll be all four of us on, on a potty. Yeah, um, I'm thinking, it. the perfect time, Unity Day. Sounds good. Oh, Late yeah, January. Unity Day. Oh, let's yeah. get together and unify the two podcasts for an episode. Okay. I'm up for it. Yours or ours or both? Uh, both. We'll, we'll do we'll do a simultaneous podcast, a dual Beautiful. podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what we could w- even work out. I could come and fucking join you wherever you record at in, in the better. bunker. Yeah. In the bunker. <laughs> in the studio. I could get smashed. Ah, <laughs> oh, that'd be good fun. Anyway. No, see, you, you forget our uh, impromptu episode. It, it's never oh, a good idea. I was watching. I, yeah, was, I know you were. <laughs> that was hilarious. I, the thing that I loved was the way you knew the words to that song from um, the, what's the fucking, I'm so bad with names. You it know that trick. Aladdin song? Yeah, it's the, um, yeah, I wish, uh, the whole new world. Yeah, and you knew all of the words to it, and I was like, this is fucking amazing. Yeah, that that's the point that show got to where, yeah, we went, I think it was like hour four, and we went into karaoke where we were singing the yeah, Fresh Prince of Bel Air, we were singing Informer, and then it went on to you know Disney theme songs at, at one particular point. That's when it's like yeah. we probably need to delete this podcast. Yeah, that, that, that's <laughs> yeah. the turning point right there. <laughs> that's it. That's the jumping the shark moment. All right, about well, if you want to follow Greedo on Twitter, follow at the Starting Block. No K on the end. Drop the K. Um, thanks for dropping by, mate. We better let you go take a piss. Ah, thanks for having me on, boys. Really appreciate it. Thank no you. Worries. And, uh, right, have a good other. We'll catch you all later.